Ooh, I thought I would use this thing. <laughs> Be careful with that way. I know. This thing is, uh, well, I never have to use it again. <laughs> Welcome. Uh, this is the meeting of the Northampton City Council. It's June 20th, 2019. My name is Ryan O'Donnell. I'm the council president, so I'll be presiding tonight. First thing I would like to do is announce the audio and video recording of these proceedings. We're going up on NCTV live in the beautiful city of Northampton. Um, and we begin always with public comment. This is your time, your chance to talk about any issue that you want. Uh, there's only a couple rules. Uh, first, if you would please keep your comments to three minutes or less. And the reason for that is I want everyone to have an equal amount of time um, and make sure that everyone gets to be heard. And the other thing to remember is we don't have a back and forth with you. It's your time to give your opinion to us. And that sounds like a funny rule at first because you would think if you come to the city council, you would want a response. But the reason is we can only discuss things that we put on our agenda. So our rule during public comment is you express your thoughts to us and you can always follow up with your counselors individually afterwards. So those are just the two things. I have a sign-up sheet. I'm going to go through it. And when it's done, I'll just ask if anyone else who hasn't signed up would, would like to talk. Okay. Um, so the first person is, um, and if I can't read it, I'm going to, I'm going to mumble and, and purposely <laughs> fudge it. Um, Dr. Nandi um, Quow from Springfield. Will you come correct me and give give your name and floor is yours. Hello, my name is uh, Nandi Chihambori Kwao, and I am an OBGYN physician in Springfield. Thank you for allowing me to speak here today. Um, I come here to speak as a provider of women's health care um, and to speak to the vital importance of this bill um, and what it can do to enshrine the access to choice in this state um, and protect women, particularly women of color and low-income women, um, from a paternalistic medical system. Um, and I'm encouraged that this is a topic here today and that this is an open forum for debate. And I just want to speak a little bit about how this bill um, will, first of all, protect the relationship that I and providers like myself have with our patients um, to help and support them in making their health care choices um, from, through, no matter what they choose. Okay. Um, and also to remove medically inaccurate information from the conversation um, that is inflammatory and only seeks to inflame people's passions as opposed to um, really get to the heart of the matter um, and the fact that this is a health care decision that should be made between women, their families, and their health care providers. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, next would be Corey Ellen uh, Gats Gatzel. Gatzel. <laughs> Welcome. Hi. Um, I want to thank you, members of the Northampton City Council, for having this forum today and allowing me to speak. Uh, my name is Corey Ellen Gatrell. I am a registered nurse. Um, I provide care to pregnant people in Western Massachusetts across the full spectrum of reproductive outcomes. I care for people welcoming their first baby or their fifth. I care for people grieving stillbirth and miscarriage. And I care for people who are terminating pregnancies. And I want to emphasize to you today that these people are often the same people at different moments in their lives. As a nurse, I share an intimate space with these families during an intimate time. And I'm here to tell you that they are afraid. They read and they watch the news. They know that their rights and their futures are not secure. And the Roe Act would make my patients safer and eliminate significant barriers to their care. It would remove the legal cognitive dissonance, which currently means that my 16-year-old patient in one setting may consent to an epidural or a cesarean section, but not in another setting when she requires an abortion. It would prevent heartbroken families from having to travel out of state when a lethal anomaly becomes apparent after 24 weeks. And it would ensure that my patients who are on public assistance and public insurance have equitable access to abortion as we know, restrictive laws that target funding mechanisms such as insurance hit our most vulnerable patients the hardest. So now is the moment for our Commonwealth and our community to publicly affirm their commitment to protecting the full humanity of people who are pregnant or might become pregnant. And I'm proud to be a member of a community which is ready to take that stand. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you for those comments. Um, I'd like to ask Carrie Baker to come up next. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Councillor O'Donnell and members of the Northampton City Council, thank you for the opportunity to speak today in support of the Roe Act resolution. My name is Carrie Baker, and I'm the president of the Abortion Rights Fund of Western Massachusetts. We give financial support to people who do not have money to cover the cost of abortion. Restrictions on abortion, like Massachusetts parental consent law and its ban on abortion after 24 weeks in the case of fatal fetal anomaly, delay access to abortion care and increase the cost. These delays can make abortion financially inaccessible for people who might already be struggling the most, like young people. The Roe Act would eliminate the onerous judicial bypass process teenagers must navigate to access safe legal abortion. A study published last April in Obstetrics and Gynecology, which I can provide to you, I have a copy of the study. It was conducted by investigators at Brigham and Young Women's Hospital. Report that, uh, excuse me, Brigham and Women's Hospital, reported that the judicial bypass process in Massachusetts causes significant delays in abortion access. These delays and the resulting increase in costs cause young people undue stress, anxiety, and fear. No other pregnancy-related health care requires parental consent. Research shows that parental consent laws do not significantly increase the likelihood that a young person will consult with a parent about their abortion decision. According to the study I just mentioned, 77% of minors in Massachusetts talk with their parents about abortion, about their abortion decision. When minors use judicial bypass, it's often because their parents are not available. They're medically incapacitated, in jail, or otherwise unavailable. In fact, the rate of Massachusetts youth consulting their parents um, about their abortion decision is very similar to rates in states without parental consent requirements. Eliminating the parental consent and bypass requirements can increase the likelihood that a young person will receive the care they need in a timelier, safer manner with significantly less fear and stress. Therefore, we support the elimination of the parental consent for minors to access abortion care. States across the country are banning safe legal abortion and forcing their residents to cross state lines or go without care. The Roe Act would ensure that in Massachusetts, safe legal abortion is accessible to all people. Please vote in favor of the Roe Act resolution. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that testimony. We appreciate it. Do you want this study, by the way? Uh, uh, would, would you mind? Yeah, we can put it in the you. record. And <coughs> Along with some other um, studies on judicial bypass for minors. That's very much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we will take that up into uh, the, the record. Thing. Uh, and I'll ask next uh, Reverend Peter Ives to come on. My name is Peter Ives, and it's good to be with you all tonight. I'm here to support the Roe Act. I've been a minister of the first churches here in Northampton for 22 years and now serve the Haydenville Congregational Church. As a minister, I have publicly supported the Supreme Court decision, Roe versus Wade, <coughs> since 1973 when it was enacted. And I do it in the name of Jesus and the stories in the Bible about Jesus' love and compassion and support to all the women in need he encountered. There was a time in my life when my wife and I had three very young children with very little income and much uncertainty, and we had an unexpected pregnancy, and the need for an abortion. In due time, we came to see that this decision was absolutely the right decision for our family life together. Many religious people have very different interpretations about when life begins. I personally do not agree with the Right to Light movement and their theory of the first heartbeat that many right-wing Christians espouse in America today. I'm not in agreement with the Christians who espouse this. I strongly believe that access to an abortion is a very important right. Without it, many, many women in our country live in a form of slavery, social injustice, and isolation that imprisons their life. 
I believe that every woman has the primary right to protect the life of her own body and make decisions about <coughs> her own body and her own family needs and the opportunity to make their health and medical decisions as women in consultation with their own health care providers. And that means to me that when the time comes when a woman feels that she cannot be a mother because of obstacles in the way, she needs to have access to a safe and affordable abortion when needed. And I ask your support for the role at, at this time. Thank you, Reverend Ives. Um, before we go on, I, I see people sitting on the ground back there. And I always, I have no problem giving up city council seats personally, so. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, if I may. Councilor. Oh, actually, you have plenty of <laughs> You're stacked up. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just going to go home with that. Okay. Right. We have plenty of chairs. All right. So everyone has a place to sit. Um, let me ask uh, Reverend Marissa Brown Ludwig to come up. Thank you to all the members of Northampton City Council for letting me speak to support Resolution 19091, Roe Act resolution. Because of its clear support of bills that currently are proposed by our state and federal legislators to protect and expand to full, safe reproductive health choices for all women, regardless of income or privilege. I am Marisa Brown Ludwig, a Northampton resident and an ordained minister in the United Church of Christ. My denomination, the United Church of Christ, has been an advocate for women's rights and reproductive justice since our first resolution of conscience that addressed freedom of choice concerning abortion in 1971. Through it all and subsequent resolutions of support, the guiding faith principle of the UCC has been one of compassion for the women who are faced with very personal decisions about pregnancy that's often impacted by racism, sexism, poverty, rape, physical and mental illness, the violence of war and harm within their own homes, as well as the needs of their already existing family. The UCC also upholds the right to religious liberty that affirms women's moral agency to make decisions based on their own religious beliefs and convictions, as well as affirms the moral agency of the medical staff who provide these services. I believe that it is only in freedom accessible to all that the values of my faith compels me to defend may stand. Compassion, mercy, justice, and love, only then can they flourish for all in freedom, not in forced law. I agree with my clergy colleagues across many faiths who promote the sacredness of all life, that people should be fully educated about all other choices first, that might protect and sustain life before making a decision to end it, and I believe that no one can truly understand the interdependence that the beginning of human life has inside a woman's body, that people of deep faith and science disagree exactly where the beginning of protectable life is during pregnancy, and that therefore the complex decisions about pregnancy and childbirth should only be between a woman and her partner, her doctor, and her God. That means that we as a free society must do everything we can to make sure every woman has that full freedom, including the ability to decide when and if to have children, the access to good health care and birth control, economic stability and safety for her and her family, access to good nutrition and education and opportunity so all human families can grow and make meaning with their lives, with the dignity and the trust that we promise to all who live in this land. And I am terrified by the threats to these freedoms that are happening in our country at this time. So thank you. Please vote yes in support of this resolution. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. Um, let's see. We have Reverend Margaret Bullet jonas Three reverends walk into a city council. <laughs> <laughs> you, don't, you don't know that. I think you're going to hear so <laughs> Similar message. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, and the, the floor, the floor thank is yours. You. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to speak in support of the Roe Act resolution. 
My name is Margaret Bullet Jonas. I live in Northampton. I've been an Episcopal priest for 30 years, and I work for the Episcopal Diocese of Western Massachusetts. I'd like to make two comments, uh, one personal and one religious. On a personal note, my mother's mother, Elizabeth Bates Coles, was a founder of the Maternal Health League, which later became Planned Parenthood, in Iowa in the 1930s. She was primarily responsible for the opening of Iowa's first birth control clinic in 1935 and went on to work for Planned Parenthood in Minneapolis. So I, I feel as if I'm standing here in the lineage of my grandmother and of all the men and women over the generations and through decades who have been struggling to protect uh, women's access to reproductive health care. And on a religious note, I would like to summarize very briefly what the Episcopal Church has to say about abortion. The, uh, our church's position, in my view, is both nuanced and clear. The Episcopal Church teaches that all human life is sacred. Hence, it is sacred from its inception until death. We regard all abortion as having a tragic dimension, calling for the concern and compassion of all the Christian community. In a series of statements over the past decades, the church has declared that we emphatically oppose abortion as a means of birth control, family planning, sex selection, or any reason of mere convenience. At the same time, since 1967, the Episcopal Church has maintained its, quote, unequivocal opposition to any legislation on the part of the national or state governments which would abridge or deny the right of individuals to reach informed decisions about the termination of pregnancy and to act upon them. And at last summer's general convention, the Episcopal Church called for, quote, women's reproductive health and reproductive health procedures to be treated as all other medical procedures. The convention declared, quote, equitable access to women's health care, including women's reproductive health care, is an integral part of a woman's struggle to assert her dignity and worth as a human being. So in, in short, as a granddaughter of a founder of Planned Parenthood in Iowa, and also as a faithful Christian and an Episcopal priest, I ask you to vote in favor of the Roe Act resolution. Thank, thank you very much for those, for those comments. Appreciate that. Um, looks like Anthony Patillo has crossed his name out. OK. Yep, he left. Yep. Okay. And um, so, Amy Martin, please. Hi there. Hello. Uh, I'm Amy Martin. I live in Florence, and I'm here to speak also in favor of the city's resolution in support of safeguarding abortion access in Massachusetts and federally. I fully support all of the measures of this resolution, but as a parent of a teenager, I wanted to focus on the uh, unnecessarily onerous parental consent law that currently exists here and in many states. Um, I also read that same study and uh, some of the related laws that we currently have on the books here and um, also noted how that most teens in Massachusetts are able to talk to their parents about their uh, pregnancies and their guardians as well and I of course hope that my teenager would. Um, in an ideal world all teens would talk to their parents um, and all parents would, would uh, have the trust of their children. Um, just as ideally we would have parents who uh, weren't violent or neglectful of their children. But we don't live in that world. We live in a world where some children aren't safe with their parents and they need an option to get care without their parents' involvement. Um, as also mentioned, the judicial bypass option creates unnecessary, unnecessary barriers for teens with phone calls and appointments with counselors and lawyers and travel during a school day for a hearing before a judge who, unlike medical staff, is not trained to support young people to protect their health and safety, to re recognize any signs of abuse, and who is not mandated, mandated to report that abuse. Furthermore, also, um, as mentioned, um, the bypass procedure does delay teens moving forward with their choice, and in fact, that study documented that nearly 20% of minors had delays of three weeks or more in Massachusetts um, before they were able to get that judicial approval and time that really potentially changes the options that they have for a safe abortion procedure. I also do understand that current state law um, allows pregnant minors to make all other medical decisions related to their care and so that repealing the parental consent law makes us consistent in our belief that teens are capable of making all decisions related to their pregnancies. 
Um, as you may know, Vermont and New York also don't require parental consent, and so some teens in Massachusetts travel to those states for their procedures. And parental consent is opposed by the American Medical Association and the American Academy of Pediatrics. I have worked in medical centers that provided abortion twice, and so as I dug deeper into the existing barriers uh, to abortion in Massachusetts, I thought, why did it take me so long to work to change these restrictions? They're so unjust. And so I'm very grateful to the city councilors who, uh, along with our legislators and advocates and educators, teens and parents, and everyone who has worked so hard to give women and all people the dignity of having control over our own bodies and our own lives. Thank you for this resolution, and I hope you vote to support it again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Elliot Rackton. Good evening. My name is Elliot Fracken. I live on Massasoit Street in Northampton, and um, I'm a recently retired professor of anthropology at Smith College. And I think we all know as residents of Northampton that our town has a great legacy in terms of women's rights and women's freedoms. And I really urge you to, and I think you all will, support the Roe Amendment that's being introduced in the State House in, in Boston. Um, it's, this is particularly important <clears throat> in this era of repression coming directly from the White House and the Republican-controlled Senate that seeks to turn back the clock over 40 years to overturn a constitutionally protected right to abortion for women. So please um, vote in support of what they're doing. This is not just a woman's rights issue, it's a human rights issue that affects all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'd like to ask Sarah Barr to come forward. It's yours. Thank you. Good evening, members of the Northampton City Council. My name is Sarah Barr, and I'm a resident of Northampton and a board member at Tapestry. Thank you for allowing me to make the case for removing obstacles to abortion access in Massachusetts. I'm here today as a representative of Tapestry Health Systems, an organization that has been providing sexual and reproductive health care in all four counties of Western Massachusetts since 1973. Tapestry does not perform abortion procedures. However, we routinely refer, refer clients to abortion providers, provide comprehensive, medically accurate information during uh, consultation sessions, and approach our reproductive health work from the understanding that abortion is a constitutional right and a valuable healthcare option for people who want to end their pregnancies. Our clinics serve 13,000 individuals each year, the majority of whom are low income, including many at or below the poverty line. <coughs> The proposed legislation comes at a critical time. While the Roe Amendment is still technically in force, which protects the right to abortion, targeted legislation throughout the country is steadily stripping away access to care. From forced pregnancy laws that prohibit abortion after only a few weeks, before many people even know that they're pregnant, to full out bans with up to 99 years in prison for any practitioners who dare perform the procedure, it is clear that the constitutional right to an abortion is under attack. Recent abortion bans in several states that seem headed to the Supreme Court threaten to eliminate this right entirely. The legislature has already shown itself to be a leader in guarding the reproductive rights of our citizens with its vote <coughs> to replace federal Title X funding if the federal government makes good on its threat to defund abortion providers. The Roe Act is the critical next step in preserving full access to care in Massachusetts. This legislation provides a powerful and necessary corrective to the misinformation, stigma, and deepening health inequities inherent to the assault on reproductive rights in the United States. Here's how. First and foremost, by clearly avowing the right to abortion in state law, the Roe Act fully protects this right, even in the event the federal amendment is overturned. By updating inflammatory and medically inaccurate definitions of abortion and pregnancy currently in Massachusetts, the Roe Act guarantees that ongoing policy development is grounded in science and medicine, in facts rather than emotions. By protecting the right to abortion after 24 weeks when there is a lethal fetal diagnosis, the Roe Act situates medical decisions in the hands of a patient and their clinician where these decisions belong. 
and by removing mandatory parental consent and a mandated 24-hour waiting period for abortion care, and by establishing a safety net of coverage for abortion care for people without health insurance, the Roe Act removes obstacles to care that disproportionately affect low-income teens and people of color. On behalf of Tapestry, we deeply appreciate the City Council's support of access to comprehensive reproductive and sexual health care, including abortion care, and its effort to support the Roe Act. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> um, Suzanne Strauss. Hi, everybody. Um, I didn't come actually to talk about the, my support of the Roe Act, but I would like to put it on the record that I do support the Roe Act. Um, and I also think that there's an issue here, sort of women's rights, that is important to think about because I've here I've come here to talk about actually the bargaining that's going on for the public schools, and because I am a female and because the about 70% of the teachers of the, and, the, and the staff of the North, all the educators of the Northampton Public Schools are women. I think that there also is, there's no, there's, a, there's an amount of sexism that is in the salaries of the people that are here. And what I came today, it's, this is the exact month that we have been in work to rule. I mean, I know that we're on summer vacation. Most people are, there's a few guidance counselors, et cetera, who are still at work. But today we were protesting outside of City Hall, and there's a lot of people there, even on their summer break. And I, th I just wanted to let you know how despondent people feel, and that there is a sense, I know that we have rainy day funds or whatever. You know, I've been teaching for almost 30 years, 21 years in Northampton, and this is the only time in all of the years where I have felt that my city is abandoning me. And I feel like there's money in the coffers wherever they are, whether it's the school side or the city side. But, you know, we really need to do something because we are hemorrhaging teachers. Today, I just found out a chemistry teacher at the high school who is much beloved and an award-winning chemistry teacher is leaving the system. There are six or seven teachers that are leaving the sixth grade. Every single teacher that I know, including myself, is looking for another job. This ha we, can, we love it here. You know, we love to teach. This is a great community, community, but we need to support the people who are doing the work, the, the cafeteria workers and everybody, the bus drivers, everybody. It's just we've got to do something because, I, I mean, people are feeling really sad. So I don't have any prepared remarks. I just came to tell you how it feels. And, you know, I think that there's a link between sort of women, being a woman and sort of neglect, and we've got to right the wrongs that have been happening. I've been here for 21 years. I think once I got a cost of living raise. The other thing I do want to mention is Dr. Provost is comparing us to Ludlow. I don't think anybody in this room wants to be compared to the Ludlow School District. <laughs> and the other thing is, though, is that they have a cost of living raise that they put on their COLA, on their, um, their bar, their, whatever people make, whatever you call that list. And they are making, every teacher there is making between seven and $9,000 more than the Northampton Public School teachers. Thank you. Okay, thank you for those, those remarks. Um, it's Liz Friedman here. Um, I'm Liz Friedman. I live in Northampton. I'm here tonight as a commissioner representing both the Massachusetts Commission on the Status of Women, the Franklin Hampshire Commission on the Status of Women, and in my role as chair of our legislative committee. I'm here because the threat to abortion access is one of the most important issues that women are currently facing. And I believe that obstacles to abortion are in direct conflict with women having <coughs> a protected right to our full personhood. I believe that every woman must have the support and resources that we need to lead our lives as we see fit. This includes having full access over our own bodies, having full access to health care, and to ensuring that we have the ability to make decisions that affect us directly. I believe that it is essential that women have a protected right to bodily autonomy. If we do not have protected right to bodily autonomy, then we have destroyed the very foundation of our personhood. 
This includes having access to reproductive health care, including abortion, and access to health insurance so that we can afford the medical care we need, including abortions. This includes having protections so that we can make decisions when we need to make them, with no 24-hour waiting periods, and share our health care choices with the people we trust, not with people who have been given power over us. We know that no matter whether abortion is legal or not, the number of abortions will actually not change. Only the <coughs> circumstances of those abortions will change. They will go from safe to dangerous, from accessible to risky, and from life choices to life ending. I believe that we are in dangerous times, and this time demands of each of us that we take a stand on our most basic beliefs our belief that every woman has a right to our own bodies, our own autonomy, and that we are fully valued. We in Northampton are a small community, but we have a mighty role to play in these dangerous times. <clears throat> it is not clear that Roe will pass at the state level, and I want to just be very clear about that. It is not clear that this is going to pass at the state level. This means that each of our voices matters. Our passing this resolution matters, and I urge you to each vote yes, in support of this resolution and show that Northampton is fully united in demanding that we as a commonwealth protect every woman's right to her body, her destiny, and her personhood. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for that testimony. Um, I'd like to ask Laura Britton. Is Laura, uh, Laura Britton is back there. Um, for the city councilors who were here last time, they've heard this, but I'll just, there are new ears in the room. Um, so I stand here in support of the Roe Act. Um, I stand here not only as the legislative aide to Representative Lindsay Sabadosa, who is the rep to the 1st Hampshire District, I am also an intake volunteer for the Abortion Rights Fund of Western Massachusetts and have been for about a year. For those who don't know the fund, our mission is to provide direct financial assistance to those seeking abortions who cannot afford them. In short, we help people afford health care because that's what abortion is. Those in need of financial assistance for their procedure call the fund cell phone. Intake volunteers take basic information, determine how much funding can be provided, and call a pledge into whichever clinic is seeing the patient. A month ago, on May 7th, more than a month ago at this point, um, Georgia Governor Brian Kemp signed a so-called fetal, fetal, fetal heartbeat bill. Sorry. The next day, I called in a pledge to an Atlanta, Georgia clinic, which helped a caller afford abortion care. That same week, <coughs> the fund helped roughly five people in Massachusetts afford abortion care. Massachusetts has no fetal heartbeat bill, we have a democratic legislature and a reputation for liberal leanings. Yet we still have people struggling to afford abortion care in our state, in our communities, and in this city. Oftentimes it's people who are not eligible for mass health or have high deductibles, high deductibles. It's our undocumented community, young people in abusive households or those in abusive relationships. It's our most vulnerable populations. Some people may feel that Roe is unnecessary in Massachusetts or goes a little too far, but I'm here to tell you that I've spoken directly to people in this state who can't afford abortion care and cannot afford to travel outside of Massachusetts to receive care, who cannot ask their parents or guardians for permission to receive abortion care, or who cannot stand in front of a judge to prove that they're mature enough to receive abortion care. We're not Georgia or Alabama or Kentucky or Missouri or now Louisiana. Um, we don't have a six week or eight week outright ban, but what good is having legal abortion in Massachusetts if it's inaccessible? Massachusetts needs Roe, not just now, but for the very uncertain future of reproductive rights. Please put the Abortion Rights Fund of Western Massachusetts out of business and support this resolution. Thank you very much, thank you. Um, the last person I have signed up is Karen Foster. Welcome. I'm Karen Foster. I live on Grove Street in Northampton. Similar to Laura, I was here two weeks ago, so I won't repeat myself. We've heard heartfelt, expert, academic, spiritual testimony in this room tonight in support of your resolution for the Roe Act. I want to thank you once again for bringing it for the unanimous vote uh, two weeks ago for that. I left that night feeling pretty proud of our city and of the representation that we have. 
and as Lindsay Sabadosa and Jill Comerford work so hard on our behalf at the state level, um, I would be absolutely thrilled to see you all vote yes again tonight and make sure that they have the support of Northampton behind their good work at the state level. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so that exhausts the sheet. Is there anyone who didn't sign up who would like to speak? It seems as if you would, so come on up. Do you want to sign in? Oh, you don't have to sign in. I think we can just play it person by person. <coughs> so I'm going to change the subject a little bit. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk about measles vaccine. Um, I'm Joanne Levin. I live on Columbus in Northampton. I'm a volunteer on the Board of Health. I serve as its chair, but tonight I'm giving my own opinions. I'm not here representing each member of the board. I'm also a physician with a specialty in infectious diseases, but I'm not an expert in public health law. I believe that the advent of vaccines was one of the major public health accomplishments of the 20th century, along with getting sewage out of our streets and regulations to keep our food and water relatively free of disease. Public health initiatives always must balance the health and safety of the community with individual rights. Sometimes we as a society are fairly clear where we want to draw the line. For example, not everyone is allowed to drive a two-ton machine that we call a car. To keep us safer, the government mandates that we be of a certain age, get training, pass a test, and promise to keep that machine in working order. Imagine how it would be to drive or cross the street if we did not have those laws. So most people don't truly object to that process. Vaccination is a stickier situation. Measles vaccine, in my understanding, is almost always safe and the risk of vaccination is considerably and measurably lower than the risk of measles disease. There's a, va a public record on the CDC website called the Vaccine Adverse Event um, Reporting Site, and I looked up our data for Massachusetts for the last 20 years. There were zero cases of death or permanent harm due to the MMR vaccine. Most of us have never seen a case of measles, myself included. But we believe the science and the medical books, which tell us that one in 1,000 people who develop measles will die. Our state of Massachusetts was the first state in the United States to mandate vaccination in 1905, the smallpox <coughs> vaccine. And the law went all the way up to the Supreme Court and was upheld due to its effect in, in protecting public health. Massachusetts law mandates that children be immunized before entering school, though medical and religious exemptions were built in to accommodate exceptions. I think they expected rare exceptions. A few states do have a separate category called philosophic exemption, but Massachusetts does not. Those most at risk of getting measles are those who are too young to be vaccinated. Vaccination tends to occur at age 12 to 15 months. The unvaccinated or undervaccinated, and those who are immune compromised. Those who voluntarily decline measles vaccine risk not only developing illness themselves, but also transmitting illness to those who cannot get immunized. And those newborns and immune compromised individuals are also at increased risk of getting more severe measles and potential death. Because of pockets of lower vaccination rates, our city is a community at risk. And I believe we need to consider all of our options available to us to increase vaccination rates in the city. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think I saw someone's <laughs> hand go up. Was it yours? Please, come on up. Good evening. My name is John Martine. I live in Florence. I was walking down Main Street a couple of hours ago, and I saw 50, 60, 70 people standing in front of the city hall with placards saying, you know, we're not getting enough money, we need, we need raises, we need to be treated with more respect and that kind of thing. I, am I right? Did anybody see that? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, okay, good. I didn't just imagine it. So my first question is, uh, you have something to do with their raises? Is that what I heard? Well, you know, I, I think you might have walked in after I gave kind of the disclaimer. We, we actually are prohibited from having a back and forth because of the open meeting law. So this is your time to express yourself, and we can follow up individually afterwards. 
Uh, I know it sounds like. I, I, well, okay, all right. And this is the mayor here. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I am. Th I, I can't believe that these people were they're working 40, 50, 60, 70 hours a week, breaking their backs for the children of this community, and they have to stand on the steps of the city hall, practically begging, begging for some kind of, for some kind of raise, some kind of increase in their pay. I mean, can you imagine how humiliating that is? I mean, can, can you imagine the mayor having to stand out on the street saying, could you give me a raise? I just, I, I'm not getting enough. I, I, are, you, are you following this? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, I, I came into this just a couple of hours ago. I, I, I just, I'm flabbergasted that these poor people who work so hard have to, have to resort to carrying signs, protesting low wages. I mean, it's absolutely outrageous. I mean, it's not as though Northampton doesn't have any money. You know, it's not as though it's a poor community that doesn't have any, you know what I'm saying? Are you hearing me here? I hear you. Hello? Hi. No, I, I said I hear you. Okay, good. Unbelievable. Absolutely amazing. I'd love to talk with someone about this because I, I mean, I'm just not sure how any of you sleep at night. I mean, these people are killing themselves for our children and the whole community. I mean, what is the problem? Do you have any idea what the, oh, that's right, I can't ask you a question. Rhetorically, do you have any idea what the problem is? Why are they not getting more money? Absolutely incredible. So, thank you, and I'll say, uh, anyone can use it. My number is 413-570-3159. I can follow up with you. I'm Ryan O'Donnell. You can find me on the website also for the city. I'm happy to talk to you about this. And I appreciate your comments uh, this evening. I know it's a strange rule that we don't have a back and forth, but we just can't because look how many people have come to provide public comment. But I'm happy to talk Un with you. Unbelievable. Okay. Unbelievable. So um, is there anyone else who would like to speak who hasn't signed up? <clears throat> no? Going once, going twice? Anybody on any topic? Okay. Hearing none, uh, the council is going to convene, and I will ask for a roll of the <coughs> council for that purpose. Here. Present. Here. Present. Here. Present. Here. 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 Okay. Um, let's see, are there any one minute announcements from members of the council? Yes. Oh, so we had Councilor Barge, then Councilor White, and then Councilor Bidwell. Thank you. Councilor um, I just want to let everybody know that there will be a public forum, and this is to strengthening the access to program services and facilities for people with disabilities. This will be presented by the Northampton Disability Commission seeking comment on the draft of the ADA self-evaluation update. It will be held Monday, June 24th at 7 p.m. to 8.15 p.m. at the Northampton Senior Center in the Great Room, 67 Conn Street, Northampton, Mass. Also, there is a copy of the draft report which is available here at northamass.gov 1047/disability/commission. Great, I think. Councilor Dwyer was next. Uh, the, just giving my report of the Charter Review Committee's uh, last meeting, which discussed the issue of uh, the possibility of changing the clerk's position from an elected position to appointed. We had testimony from. <coughs> Uh, Wendy Mazza, the, the last city clerk before uh, Pam Powers, and also uh, Councilor LaBarge, both speaking in strong support of appointment over um, election. And it's worth noting 
that it was Clerk Mazzo who actually originally opposed this uh, when the initial charter was established, was, uh, had stated her objections to changing the position, but has since uh, had a change of heart and uh, spoke um, very, I thought, courageously to, in, uh, in support. Uh, the subsequent debate and discussion among the members, there was not a final vote, but there was a straw poll, and there was a unanimous um, uh, indication that they were in favor of um, advancing as a recommendation the change from election elected position to appoint position for a clerk. Um, and I think that, that was that was the, essentially the more the most critical discussion in in that. There also, but. Uh, a more open and broad discussion occurred towards the end, which was the concern about inclusion in the process and the charter discussion, trying to reach out to members of the public of underserved communities. But point in fact, actually anyone, the, the level of engagement is, it's not unusual, but it's been pretty low. But especially we're not hearing from Huge segments of the of the community and the concern about how we approach it. I mean, now we're all white on the committee. We're all of a particular class. Um, there is a desire to reach out, but the fact is that, that uh, the struggle is trying to figure out what's the best way to ascertain and hear and get participation from communities that have been underserved. Mm -hmm. And um, the, a subcommittee was formed to do outreach but at the same time analyze what it is about our process that actually establishes almost an institutional barriers um, to access so mm -hmm. that's a broader discussion that probably go hopefully will go beyond the charter review committee's uh, discussions which will end at the end of this year and become uh, uh, more broad and hopefully more effective uh, it's also worth noting that the mayor had mentioned during the course of the conversation that there was a study that actually many of us weren't aware of done by the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission that did a pretty deep dive in analyzing accessibility uh, for underserved communities and there are recommendations and, and we are since reviewing that, that study is available um, and uh, through the PVPC link, uh, and also I have a copy if anyone wants to wants to see that. So that in meeting took us uh, to about ten o'clock. It was a long meeting, but a uh, very thoughtful one. So right. and productive. Felt like you were in Philadelphia in a, the sweltering heat of a constitutional convention. <laughs> yeah, I mean, more it was wheezy air conditioning and okay. yeah, one of yeah. those. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Just a point of information, does the, does the Charter um, Committee have any sense? Is it going to really just run until the end of December and finish? Or is there a sense where you may release a report kind of earlier than that? Hmm. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not qualified to answer that because yeah. I don't know. I think the intent is to use the time that we have to... Uh, right. I mean, uh, the Chair Moulton and, and Vice Chair Hopper here uh, have... Mm -hmm. actually, there she is. Yes. <laughs> have been working diligently to actually try to uh, incorporate everything that we can possibly incorporate in the discussion and the analysis. I should also mention that, I'm sorry, that uh, the former draft committee member, Bill Scher, came and helped <coughs> us not reinvent the wheel, which was good. Uh, the, Is that the whole point, to reinvent the wheel? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if the chart yeah. is the wheel? Yes. I should interrupt you, I'm sorry. No, that's okay. <laughs> But he was quite helpful because he described and, and provided context for the same debate so we wouldn't have to con revisit the yes, same right. exactly. arguments in, in futility. And it was very helpful, and I think so. That's great. That's great. Um, well, thank you for that update. Um, so we'll turn to Councilor Bidwell. For uh, thank you. I would like uh, folks to know that this Saturday is the grand opening of an exhibit at Historic Northampton many years in the works. Making it on Main Street, 400 years of history. There was a, a, a preview of it that some of us saw earlier today, and it's just stunning. Uh, it's been a remarkable effort involving hundreds of people from the community, craftsmen, historians, interpreters, writers, photographers. And it's a fascinating history of Northampton by way of the changes on Main Street. 
-hmm. architectural, cultural, economic, demographic through the years. Um, I highly recommend going to the grand opening Saturday, going any time in the, in the weeks and months ahead. It's uh, in many ways also signifies a dramatic uh, new stage in the redevelopment, if you will, of historic Northampton, a real community treasure. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Klein and then Councillor Sharon. I have another grand opening on Saturday. This is from 10 to 12 um, on Saturday. The Beaver Brook Greenway um, recreation area that has been worked on for close to two years now by the Broadbrook Coalition and the Leeds Civic Association and um, a lot of residents of Leeds um, have been working to kind of create a clearing in a conservation area, new, newly purchased conservation, semi newly purchased conservation area in Leeds. Um, they cleared trails, they, they created a wildlife blind. Um, and so there will be kind of an overview of the new space and a tour and lemonade and cookies and hope <coughs> people will come to that. And one other thing is um, on Monday, this coming Monday, June 24th at six o'clock at the Florence Civic Center, uh, there will be uh, sponsored by the Planning and Sustainability Department a uh, Florence Village community meeting. This is the second one uh, to look at what kind of downtown streetscape in Florence, center of Florence streetscape we want to build. Um, the, we'll go over plans that were developed by Dodson and Flinker and, um, and, and do it as an interactive kind of exercise for people to talk about what they would like to see in the center of Florence. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Sharon? Um, well, if people were trying to figure out how to get to the Beaver Brook Greenway and to the historic Northampton event and to Pulaski Park for the Valley Community Development uh, Block Party, that's what I'm about to say, <laughs> yeah. you should know that that has been canceled. So you can make it to those two other events and don't go to Pulaski Park, but hopefully they'll be able to reschedule at some point. A non-announcement. Yes, a non an announcement. <laughs> Still have a full dance card, though, for that day, it sounds like. Yep. Any other announcements? Okay. Um, so none from me. Um, Mr. Mayor, you have a communication today or presentation? Yeah. Yeah, so this is a presentation by members of Nuclear Band at U.S. on the international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons, ICANN, and the City of Northampton's treaty alignment act. So. Um, whatever you would like to do. W would the member speak, or Mr. Mayor, do you want to introduce this? Well, he's not going to speak yet. You're about to come over here. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, turn around. Everybody can Su Susan Lance will just essentially take over, so. <laughs> <laughs> Unless there's any objection, I. Susan, please. Well, I'm sure many of you in this room share my feeling of gratitude and pride in living in this community and where we have this city council and we have this mayor that often initiates, adds, supports <coughs> legislation, programs, bills <coughs> that enhances our life and makes us safer and makes us more secure. And they do that on a local level most often. Then they also do it on a state level. Sometimes it's even a national level. And I'm here to tell you tonight that they do it on an international <laughs> level as well. And starting back in November of 2017, the city council passed a resolution called Back from the Brink, which um, protected, uh, would protect us from certain actions with nuclear weapons by our federal government. Then subsequently, since then, the mayor, working with nuclear brand US, has um, made our city, the city of Northampton, compliant with the United Nations Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. It is with great pride that I present to our mayor, David Narkowitz, this certificate of alignment with the United Nations Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons for the City of Northampton. Thank you. So, so what, the, what the city 
has done for that is basically um, the mayor issued a executive order uh, last September 2018 and which legally prohibits the city from contracting with or investing in those nuclear companies that you know, have any business with nuclear companies as far as legally possible that he can do. And he followed up by writing to these companies telling them of his action. And furthermore has agreed to let other cities and towns around the area know about this and to enlist their support in it. And also has declared September 26 as International Van Nuclear Weapons Day. Again, thank you to my colleagues on the City Council who for also passing the resolution that they did in support of this. And obviously, thank you to uh, Susan and Jeff and the other folks at ICANN local, locally um, who've been helping guide us through this process. Um, we do need to do some special, we are going to pursue some special legislation, um, uh, potentially a home rule. I've been talking with um, some of our legislators about this because we, we, think we can't actually um, limit procurement from these companies because procurement law in Massachusetts doesn't allow us to discriminate against one form of company over another, but we are working on potentially some special legislation. Um, Where this us. body will come into play Yes, I, so I'm uh, maybe bringing you a home rule petition to see if we can try to carve out an exemption um, that would allow us to say that we will not do business um, with companies that are involved in the manufacture of nuclear weapons. Not that we're, you know, doing a lot of business now. Um, uh, but there are some interesting, you know, some of you may have Honeywell thermostats at home. Um, Honeywell, you know, is also a manufacturer of, uh, or was involved in the manufacture of nuclear weapons. They've since done some, some rearranging of the, their subsidiaries. But so we are going to continue to work on that. Uh, we, did know, we did send letters to the CEOs of the uh, 13 identified companies to let them know about our policy. Um, would have loved to have been a fly on the wall. <laughs> um, and so we'll just continue to work. And we have been looking at our investment portfolios. Um, unfortunately, we have um, less than you know, one percent. It's a very small percentage. Um, again, one of the challenges we've we've um, uh, we've taken all of our uh, portfolios out of fossil fuels and divested of fossil fuels. And now something new's been added. So we're trying to figure out how we can change our screens to account for. Uh, nuclear manufacturer. But he so. cares and he's working yeah. on it. So we're working on that. Yeah. And we have one other just very exciting event that happened today. Sorry, I always choose the wrong time to go to the bathroom. <laughs> uh, so uh, one of the reasons that um, the two heads of the nuclear ban campaign couldn't be here is because this is actually a picture that was taken today um, down in D.C. with our own representative Jim McGovern. Um, and that's actually Bob Lee, who's my second favorite member of Congress. Um, and um, uh, this is uh, Tim Wallace and um, Vicki is back there. And uh, some of you might remember Aki Whelan, who's a troublemaker from this area. Um, and they were presenting Representative McGovern and Representative Lee with um, a copy of this, which is Warheads to Windmills, uh, How to Pay for a Green New Deal. Uh, and so this is a publication that is hot off the press from the nuclear ban campaign about um, exactly if, you, we, if the United States withdraws its funding for nuclear weapons, stops spending all this money on nuclear weapons, we can actually pay for the Green New Deal. Um, and Jim McGovern uh, has actually said that um, he's, when he's introducing it and he's talking about it today, he's going to be commenting that this is happening and this report is being released at the same time here in this room today in Northampton mm -hmm. because Northampton is a city that is sort of leading the way for um, the rest of the country. Um, and as an added bonus, um, Representative Lee actually pledged to give a copy of this report uh, and put it personally in the hands of Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who is the co-author of the Green New Deal. Um, and so understand that just not um, giving up nuclear weapons wouldn't just release the money to pay for the Green New Deal, it would release the brain power and those jobs in that deadly field could be transported into life-sustaining jobs in the green energy. Green energy. Let's give a copy to you. Sure. 
Center. To the City Council, too. It's we like have, we have plenty more copies in the Office of the Resistance Center down the street, too. Thank you, John. Yeah, appreciate Just one question. Susan, are you available to facilitate future city council meetings? <laughs> I think things went very smoothly, so so thank you very much for, for all your efforts. Very good. Excellent. Okay. Now, what we are going to do is proceed with some resolutions. The first is a second reading on 19.091, a resolution affirming support for uh, access to safe and legal abortion in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and across the United States. Do I hear a motion to approve? Make a second. Okay. Um, made and seconded. Any further discussion on this resolution this evening? Uh, Councilor Klein. Well, I wasn't here last time. I'm one of the co-sponsors with uh, Councilor Shara. So I didn't get to make any comments and I didn't get to thank publicly all of the people who um, helped us so much in putting this together, um, a few of whom are in the room. Um, Carrie Baker from Smith College. We have here in Northampton, we have national experts, you know, like world-class experts on uh, access to reproductive health care and abortion, um, Carrie Baker being one of them, um, uh, Mia, uh, Mia Sullivan, do I have that right? Mia Kim Sullivan from CLIP at Hampshire College is another one. Um, a number of people in this room were incredibly helpful in putting it together, Liz Friedman being one of them. Um, Jennifer McKenna, who also couldn't be here tonight because she's in Ireland speaking to the parliament there about abortion. Um, so I, I'm just very grateful and I wanted to make that um, known publicly. And I want to thank Councillor Shara for introducing it and shepherding it so nicely last uh, meeting. And I'm sorry that I wasn't here. Um, I also want to thank Rachel Maori. I don't know if she's here tonight, but sh it was because of a discussion that she initiated with me um, about what we could do at the local level about uh, the Roe Act and the stuff that was going on at the federal level and um, that really prompted me to approach Councillor Shara and to write the resolution and to engage with all of these community members who um, helped put this together. So I have a few remarks and I know that you know there's far more expertise in this room than I have on this subject um, and I know a lot of it has already been shared, but I would like to kind of share some thoughts. Um, I wanted to talk about the fact that we're in the midst of a really well-planned and coordinated attack on reproductive freedom in this country. And it's an attack that's putting pregnant women, trans folks, and gender non-conforming folks' lives at risk, literally putting them at risk. Abortion bans in 16 states will not only punish and even incarcerate pregnant people and the people who provide access to abortions, but um, these bans serve as blatant violations of both constitutional and human rights, and I know that that has been said tonight and it was said at the last meeting. Um, the right to health care, because make no mistake, reproductive health care, including abortion, is health care, is a human right as affirmed by the International Declaration of Human Rights, multiple bodies of the United Nations, and every human rights organization in the world. Laws that restrict or deny access to abortion are in violation of people's fundamental and constitutional rights to reproductive autonomy and privacy and to human dignity. Um, expanding the definition of personhood to include fertilized eggs, embryos, and fetuses, as many of these uh, bans and restrictions do, essentially is denying people's right to access abortion care and potentially criminalizes pregnant people, um, that, and it leads to deeply harmful outcomes for people who seek abortion care. Um, there is copious research that tells us that maternal, fetal, and newborn health suffers when the threat of punishment for seeking abortion is at play. And I really want to address this piece. To me, it's, it's a kind of a crux. Who is most likely to suffer from these laws? Um, someone, a couple people spoke to this a little bit tonight. There's no doubt that abortion is a health care, a legal, a human rights, a reproductive autonomy, and a privacy issue. But at its core, it's very much a social justice issue. There are racist and classist implications of this assault on abortion laws that are 
really at this point in plain sight. Poor people and people of color are most affected by abortion restrictions and bans. People with means are able to go, and people spoke to this, to another state or even to another country to access the care that they need. People with means are far less likely than um, poor people and people <laughs> of color to be arrested and incarcerated generally. Um, they are also the people most likely in the United States to access abortion care, people of color and poor people. Um, so I have some statistics that I think are really important to illustrate this. Among U.S. abortion patients, 75% are poor or low income, with 49% living below the federal poverty level. Um, the Guttmacher, um, Guttmacher Institute reports that black and Latina women are more likely to experience unintended pregnancies than white women and more likely to get abortions. In 2017, the abortion rate for black women was 27 for every 1,000 women of reproductive age. For Latinas, the numbers are 18 in every 1,000 women. And for white people, white women, 10 in every 1,000 women. Um, and this is due to a number of factors. A lack of adequate access to reproductive health education, lack of access to reproductive health care and contraceptives, lack of access to affordable health care, lack of access to adequate means of transportation, and of course the many other byproducts of the historical and current racism and oppression and neglect of poor people and people of color here in the United States. The organization Color of Change says that, quote, restrictive abortion measures will only further racism and misogyny by giving the state additional means to punish black pregnant people who exercise their reproductive autonomy, end quote. Um, one more quote, someone um, that I very much appreciate, the esteemed writer Margaret Atwood, who's known, of course, best for her book, The Handmaid's Tale, these days, said recently that when states obligate women, and I'll add trans and gender nonconforming people as well, um, into childbearing, they are instituting, quote, a form of slavery with two outcomes, that women die and orphanages fill up. And we can actually illustrate this very concretely by looking at data from uh, Texas. In 2011, Texas began an active process of funneling federal funds away from abortion providers. And in the past eight years, in that same time frame, maternal mortality rates have risen and birth rates have spiked. And to illustrate my previous point about who was affected most by the denial of access to abortion, um, mostly among women who rely on government, fin government funds to get medical care, talking about Texas. And it's also witnessed by the fact that in the decade following Roe versus Wade, abortion-related deaths decreased by 73%. So for all these reasons, I'm proud to have written and co-sponsored this resolution, proud that my colleagues here passed it on first reading. Thank you to all of you. I really. Um, and moved by that and moved by um, all of the public comment. It's fairly rare that we get people coming to the second reading of our resolutions too to continue to talk about uh, the content of the resolution and that very much happened tonight. So it really is testament to how much people in this community are committed to um, and unfettered access to abortion care and I, I'm very appreciative of that. Um, I'm also so grateful to our elected, um, our electeds at both the state and federal levels for being on the forefront of strengthening access to abortion in Massachusetts and across the United States. Um, special thanks to Representative Sabadosa and Senator Comerford for the sponsorship of the Roe Act in the State House, and U.S. Representative uh, McGovern and Senators Warren and Markey for their sponsorship of the Each Woman Act and the Women's Health Protection Act. And um, I do just want to make a note that it's, it's interesting to me. I watched the recording of the last meeting. I wasn't able to be here, as I mentioned. And um, somehow this resolution kind of turned into a, re a resolution about the Roe Act. And um, Councilor Sharon and I were very careful to craft it so that it was a broader statement than the Roe Act. You know, the Roe Act is at its heart for sure, but there, um, we wanted the Northampton City Council to make a broader statement, a, a broader commitment, and a deeper commitment to, um, in an ongoing way for all time, to um, to access to reproductive health care, including abortion. And um, and I think that if 
you know, you can take a look at, at, the, at the, the entire text of the resolution, you'll see that very clearly, that it does um, talk more broadly about our commitment to access to abortion. Um, so thank you all for voting on it um, last time, and I am certain that we will pass it unanimously again. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Klein. Are there other, uh, Councillor Sharon? Um, first and foremost, I want to thank Councillor Klein, since she's here in person, to receive the thanks um, for all of her work on this and uh, for adding your voice tonight, which I was looking forward to hearing on it. Um, and I want to thank, again, all that helped uh, and supported the resolution last time and through the last two weeks. Um, and all those that went to the State House last week um, to speak about the bill. Um, and, and everyone that came today, as Councillor Klein said, it's not that usual to have uh, people come to a second reading and, and speak on it. So thank you. Um, and I'll just note that the, the eloquence of the people of Northampton is often awes me and always very much humbles me. It's, your, your words were really quite remarkable tonight. Um, I hope the council agrees that uh, the last two weeks have really reaffirmed that um, these protections need to be passed in the Commonwealth. Um, as was said tonight, it's not at all guaranteed that the Roe Act will pass the state legislature. Um, the rights we currently have are not sufficiently secure, and the barriers need to be removed, especially because we cannot rely on being able to receive needed health care, health care that we should be able to receive in this state. We can't rely on being able to receive it in another state um, when reproductive health care is under attack in all states and on the federal level. Um, so along those lines of sort of looking at a broader picture and our place in it, it's been requested that I add to the record a letter from the National Institute for Reproductive Health. Um, so I'm going to read that into the record if that's okay with all. Uh, <coughs> this is dated today. And to the council members of the Northampton City Council, for more than a decade, the National Institute for Reproductive Health, NIRH, has worked closely with local advocates and elected officials from across the country working to advance reproductive health, rights, and justice in their communities. As access to abortion and contraception is under unprecedented attacks at the federal level and in many states across the country, um, and many states across the country, it's more important than ever for cities and progressive states to counter these trends. With the introduction of the Roe Act in the state legislature and Northampton's resolution tonight in support of it, the city and the state are continuing their long tradition of leadership when it comes to access to reproductive health care. The right to safe, legal abortion is at risk in our country, and while it is protected in Massachusetts, unnecessary and at times insurmountable barriers still stand in the way of access to abortion <coughs> care for many who need it. In a state known for high quality health care and near universal insurance coverage, no person should be forced to leave the state for care, no young person should be forced to have their medical decisions signed off by a judge, no medical professional should be forced to deny a patient the best possible care out of fear of criminal liability, and no person should be denied affordable access to abortion because their legal status prevents them from obtaining insurance coverage. The Roe Act would reform outdated state laws, protect the patient-provider relationship, and ensure equitable access to abortion. This supportive action by the Northampton City Council tonight is an important step towards ensuring that no one faces delays in accessing the abortion care they need by politicians trying to impose their personal ideologies on others. Tonight's resolution also includes a call for passage of the Each Woman, <coughs> excuse me, Each Woman Act on the federal level. Currently, federal law imposes unfair and unjust limitations on insurance coverage of abortion that directly impact low-income women, women of color, young women, and immigrants. In partnership with All Above All, we have supported 18 localities who have passed resolutions calling for an end to bans on abortion coverage. Austin, Texas, Boston, Cambridge, Carborough, North Carolina, Los Angeles, uh, Cook County, Illinois, Durham County, North Carolina, Durham, North Carolina, Ithaca, New York, King County, Washington, uh, Madison, Wisconsin, uh, Mahomoth County, Oregon, New York City, um, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, Seattle, St. Louis, and Travis County, Texas. We encourage the City Council to vote unanimously tonight to make Northampton the third city in Massachusetts and the 19th locality overall to join this movement. NIRH's work in cities and counties has, has demonstrated to us how important it is for local leaders to take bold action on reproductive health, rights, and justice. Northampton's commitment to ensuring access to the full range of reproductive health care, including abortion, as well as protecting an individual right to make reproductive decisions about their own bodies, is critical and laudable at a moment when our reproductive health is at risk. We thank the City Council for taking up this resolution and express our commitment to supporting your community in the months and years to come as you work to ensure that all in Northampton have access to the comprehensive reproductive health care they need. Sincerely, Jenny dodson Mystery um, from the National Institute of Reproductive Health in New York. Thank you. Thank you.
Is there any other member of the council who would like to provide any other comments? I think actually concluding with comments from the two sponsors, which were very, oh, Councilor DeBarge, did you have something? Yes. Oh, then. Okay. Right ahead. I talked about it two weeks ago, and I will come out with it again. Um, I'm <coughs> supporting this 100%. And I feel that we are in the greatest crisis in abortion access that we are forced with. There is no question about this. I feel we need to make sure everyone, everyone, every woman who needs care has the rights and resources to access it, just like I said two weeks ago. <clears throat> I feel we need to stop the attacks on women and our pregnant women and ensure access to safe and legal abortion in Massachusetts and in, in all our 50 states. <laughs> this is my right, your right, as a woman. And I feel nobody in government should tell us what to do with our bodies. I support this Roe Act 100%. Thank you, Councilor LaVarge. Are there Thank any other you. members of the council who would like to speak on this before we proceed to a vote? I think the people we heard provided a very fitting um, wrap up as to why this is something that deserves to pass unanimously here tonight. And I hope um, we see further progress at the state and federal level as well. So I'd like to thank, as others have, mm -hmm. everyone who've, who's come to support this proposition and also personally thank the sponsors for their work on this and a very important effort. So hearing no other desire for comments, perhaps we can have a roll call vote. Councilor Bidwell. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Clark. Yes. Councilor Bidwell. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor Yes. Yes. Councilor Yes. Councilor Yes. Councilor Yes. 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 Y
be and hereby is requested to forward a suitable engrossed copy of this resolution to the Massachusetts Cultural Council, the Economic Development Coordinator, and the Director of the Arts Council on behalf of the entire City Council with the understanding that the additional application materials will be completed for review and implementation by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So I hear a motion is to approve so first moved. reading. Second. Okay, made and seconded. Mr. May, do you want to introduce us further? Uh, I think it's fairly self-explanatory. Um, uh, those of you who drive into Northampton uh, see the signs for the Paradise uh, Cultural District, uh, Paradise City Cultural District, a designation we received a few years ago. The law does re require us to kind of reapply, to, to redesignate it. Um, and so the Arts Council has uh, uh, fully supports us doing that, as does uh, Mr. Foote, the Director of uh, Culture and Recreation, and I support it. Um, so we want to get this resolution, which is one of the components of uh, filing the application. Um, the Cultural District uh, obviously, you know, demarcates our, our commitment to the arts and how important it is uh, to uh, the downtown uh, district, um, but it also provides us with uh, access to funding. Uh, those of you who enjoyed the recent public art festival, um, we received a grant uh, of $5,000 uh, to help support that public art festival that was directly a result of being a cultural district and having access to those funds. And we've received other funds as well. So there's not only is it important uh, designation, but it also provides us with access to funds um, because of the fact that we've, you know, made this commitment to uh, to the arts and designated the district. So I would ask the council to uh, to support um, renewing the designation so that we can complete the application. Good. Thank you. Uh, questions, comments on this from the council. Uh, I agree. It seems straightforward and totally in keeping with what we want to do in Northampton. So I'm happy to support it personally. Excellent. Okay. Any other thoughts? We have a motion on the floor. Um, might as well have a roll call vote on this, please. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor White. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. yes. Councilor Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor Donald. Yes. Councilor Shara. Yes. And Councilor Bidwell. Yes. Okay, approved in first reading. Next is 19.096, a resolution encouraging the Northampton Board of Health and the Massachusetts State Legislature to take action to increase measles immunization rates in our communities. Um, from time to time, the actual sponsors of the resolutions favor us with a reading. I don't know if that might be the, the case this evening. Councilor Bidwell, would you be willing to read the resolution? Your name appears first on it. Um, sure, I'll give you a break from resolution reading. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> Not buying a vote, though. So. <laughs> okay, duly noted. You probably have it, so. Well, I don't know. <laughs> um, in the City Council, June 20th, 2019. Upon the recommendation of Councilor Dennis Bidwell and Councilor Gina Louise Sciarra, uh, a resolution encouraging the Northampton Board of Health and the Massachusetts State Legislature to take action to increase measles immunization rates in our communities. Whereas from January 1 to June 13, 2019, 1,044 individual cases of measles have been confirmed in 28 states in the United States, including Massachusetts which is the greatest number of cases reported in the U.S. since 1992 and since measles was declared eliminated in 2000. Whereas measles is eight times more contagious than influenza and is over three times more contagious than Ebola, in part because of an individual who has become infected can be contagious for four days prior to being symptomatic and for four days after the appearance of a rash. Whereas those not vaccinated and in close proximity of an infected person have a 90% chance of contracting measles. Whereas measles can result in encephalitis and or deafness and in some cases can cause death. Whereas, quote, herd immunity, quote, to measles occurs when approximately 95% of the individuals in a group have immunity, either through vaccination or previous exposure to the disease. And that, and that immunization rates below that number put individuals at much greater risk of contracting the disease. Whereas low immunization rates pose a particular risk for immune compromised individuals and for infants too young to be vaccinated. Whereas one reason that some communities have relatively low immunization rates is that a large number of families in these communities assert their quote, religious exemption to vaccinations as permitted by state law. Whereas religious exemptions to vaccinations claimed in the Commonwealth increased 
from 0.18% of children in the 1987-88 school year to 1.08% in 2017-18, which is a five-fold increase. This trend is despite a consistent downward trend in, relig <coughs> in religiosity in Massachusetts over that same time period. Whereas Massachusetts law requires that children entering children or public schools offer proof of measles vaccination unless they assert a medical or religious exemption to vaccination. Whereas Hampshire County and Franklin County have some of the highest rates in the state of exemption rates, with some schools reporting kindergarten age children with exemption rates as high as 25 percent. Whereas the MMR vaccine, measles, mumps, rubella, has been repeatedly in, and invariably shown to be very safe and effective, whereas the American Medical Association and the Massachusetts Medical Society have stated their opposition to all but medical exemptions to vaccinations, whereas Northampton's Board of Public Health and Public Health Department have been proactive in their public information campaigns and their outreach to schools, hospitals, and pediatrics practices regarding the dangers of not vaccinating against measles, Whereas the authority of local boards of health to act further in this area is limited by laws that can only be changed by the Massachusetts legislature. And whereas on May 24, 2019, Maine became the fourth state in the country, joining California, West Virginia, and Mississippi to disallow a religious exemption to vaccination. Now, therefore be it resolved that the Northampton City Council commends the Northampton Board of Health and Northampton Public Health Department for their work in educating the public about the dangers of low vaccination rates. And be it further resolved that the Northampton City Council <coughs> urges the Northampton Board of Health to explore further actions it could take to increase vaccination rates through such measures as requiring a sworn affidavit or signature from clergy to substantiate a claim of religious exemption from vaccinations. And be it further resolved that the Northampton City Council urges the Massachusetts House to take up and approve HD 4284 which is co-sponsored by our representative Lindsay Sabadosa, which would eliminate the religious exemption to vaccinations, allowing only medical exemptions. Be it further resolved that the Northampton City Council urges the Massachusetts Senate to take up similar legislation with the intent of eliminating the religious exemption to vaccinations, allowing only medical examination, uh, exemptions. Be it further resolved that the administrative assistant to the Northampton City Council shall cause a copy of this resolution to be sent to State Senator and Senate Chair of the Joint Committee on Public Health, Joanne Comerford, State Representative Lindsay Sabadosa, Senate President Karen Spilka, House Speaker Robert Leo, House Chair of the Joint Committee on Public Health, John J. Mahoney, Governor Charles Baker, Northampton Board of Health Chair Joanne Levin, and Northampton Public Health Director Meredith O'Leary. Thank you very much. So do I hear a motion on this to approve in first reading? So moved. Second. Okay. Uh, discussion on the resolution. Oh, uh, Council I'll, Chair. I'll give you a well, break. Well, yes, I was going to say, but if you want to give me a little breather. I'll give you a breather. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll start by thanking Councillor Bidwell, who, um, who's really led on engaging the Council on this issue, both at our Community Resources Committee, uh, but also with this resolution. So I, I thank him deeply for that. Um, I also want to thank the Northampton Public Health Director, Mer Meredith O'Leary, and Jenny Meyer, the city's public health nurse, and Dr. Levin. Um, the chair of the Board of Health for their help and um, for coming to Community Resources to talk about the the current situation in Northampton and uh, what they think can be helpful. Um, and their opinion is absolutely paramount because this is fundamentally about public health. Um, it is about what we know to be fact, which is that vaccines are safe and that the diseases that they prevent are not safe. Um, here in Hampshire County, we have higher unvaccinated rates than the state average and the rates have been trending upward. Two of our elementary schools have unvaccinated rates that are alarming and do pose a public health threat. In the county, these two schools have the second and third highest rates um, and those two schools are the two, uh, <coughs> the two public schools with the highest rates in the county. Um, so again, this is a public health issue. Whether families are choosing not to vaccinate because of factually wrong information or a lack of information, um, we need to do better with reaching vaccine hesitant families um, and providing them with correct information, but also with the support they need to overcome um, their fear or uncertainty around vaccines. Uh, everyone who, everyone, we all know that everyone really wants to do what's best and safest for their children. And we know with 
absolute certainty that vaccinating them is the safest uh, thing for their health <coughs> and it's also um, the safest thing for the community's health. Um, there will always be those that cannot be vaccinated um, for medical reasons. And as Dr. Levin said, um, babies can't, are not vaccinated until they're 12 to 15 months old. So um, those, that population needs the protection of those that can be safely vaccinated, and that is essentially almost everybody else. Um, so I just want to say that you know I, I always support religious freedom, um, and I have a really a great deal of respect for people's personal religious beliefs. But when the expression of one's religious beliefs puts other lives at risk, then that really goes beyond an individual's rights. Um, and we also know that uh, religious leaders from major faiths have clearly stated that not only is it not um, not only do they is there not a moral objection to uh, vaccinations, but as the Vatican Academy put it, there is quote a moral obligation to guarantee the vaccination coverage necessary for the safety of others end quote. Um, <clears throat> so we hope the council will agree that we should support the health department in exploring ways to help vaccine hesitant <coughs> families get the correct information they need and um, in trying to require further documentation for their exemptions and that um, you also will, will support the current House bill and encourage the Senate to address this issue of exemptions um, in their body. So thank you. Thank you. So now should we go back to Council from Ward 2? Uh, I, I, I would be glad to say just a, just a okay. few additional words, um, but the resolution itself and Councilor Shar's remarks cover uh, most of what needs to be said along with what we heard from Dr. Levin. I would just want to emphasize two things. One, just so it's so clearly out there on the record about the, the, how safe this vaccine is. Um, much to the regret of everybody in public policy and in public health, a uh, bogus and totally fraudulent study was published in 1998 in a medical journal by a doctor who has since lost his medical license. He's been totally repudiated. But nevertheless, this study claimed that there was a link between the measles vaccine and autism. It was based on false data. It's been totally discredited. The journal that published it has, has announced that they never should have published it. Um, nevertheless, it, it pops up uh, in, a, in an era when folks want to can find anything on the internet, they can find this and say, aha, I always thought there was something fishy about this. It's totally, totally bogus. Um, and it needs to be said as many times as possible that it is bad science, there's nothing to it. Uh, there is a, a, an incredibly well documented, very, very, very high safety rate, uh, particularly as Dr. Levin said, in relation to the dangers of, of contracting the disease. Um, it's also a very, very effective vaccine. Uh, when taken in the proper <coughs> sequence of two doses, it has a 97% effective rate. Um, so the, this is an area where science really needs to be out there. There is real data, and it needs to be uh, out there in, uh, to, to, to beat down uh, false information that sometimes still is alive and well out there. So all of this is why um, I think it's important that the religious exemption uh, that the legislature seriously consider eliminating it, as has happened in other states, because as we've heard, we have no philosophical objection here. So it means that you can have a medical exemption or you can have a religious exemption. So it means the religious exemption, because it's very loosely defined and loosely administered, becomes a catch-all for anybody that has any squeamishness whatsoever about it and says, well, I'm not sure, so I think I'll just claim a religious exemption. Um, it either needs to be dramatically tightened up or preferably eliminated. Um, and let me just conclude with my own little comment on uh, the religious freedom matter, because it, it's, it's critically important. Uh, I, too, will be on the record as supporting religious liberty and, and expression of religious freedom. Um, but I don't believe that extends to the point where it begins to endanger other members of the community, and that's what is at risk here. Uh, as has been noted, we accept restrictions on other freedoms. We accept restrictions on free speech. Uh, quite, quite famously, we don't permit people to, s to scream fire in an auditorium. That's free speech, but it endangers the public by doing so. Similarly, this is an appropriate restriction on religious freedom, I believe, uh, because if it continues to provide opportunities 
uh, for people to infect other members of the community by claiming it's a, a religious exemption, then I think that's where we need to draw the line. And I would hope my colleagues here would support um, Councilor Shara and me in urging the legislature to look at this seriously, hopefully to consider removing the religious exemption and to encourage our local Board of Health to continue doing their excellent work, including uh, community conversations that they're having because they know better than anybody that uh, sometimes it takes educated conversations with member with sometimes skeptical members of a community to, br to bring them around in combination with the science. So I have great respect for the work of our Board of Health and their continued work in this area. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Barge, and then. Yes, um, I thank you, Councilor Bidwell. I think you explained it very, very thoroughly. But maybe somebody can explain to me the second paragraph on the bottom, before the bottom. With the intent of eliminating the religious exemption to vaccinations, allowing only medical exemptions. How, do you, how can you actually make that difference? If somebody's religious, religion doesn't agree to this, that's understandable here. My question, doctor, is medical exemptions, like what? Uh, so I'm hearing that there's a desire to recognize Dr. Yes, Lovett. I'd like to be recognized, Dr. Lovett. Motion to recognize Any Dr. Lovett. discussion on that motion? Then all in favor, please say aye. Any aye. Any abstentions? Doctor, please come up to the podium. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, there are medical reasons why people um, should not take the vaccine. Um, some people can be allergic to an antibiotic that's, uh, I think it's neomycin, that's in the vaccine. Uh, people who are immune compromised can't take the vaccine. People who are younger than six months of old can't take the vaccine. So there are, are documented medical reasons why certain people can't take the vaccine. Now, I also am reading about it can cause deafness. What's the age where that could occur? Um, I'm not a pediatrician, so I have to I think qualify. you might be referring to measles. Pardon? Maybe you're referring to measles. Can yeah. Fitness? Not the vaccine. Not measles. the vaccine, but right. measles. Right. Yeah, so measles um, is, I think, one of the issues that a lot of people think of it as, oh, a usual childhood disease that's sort of a pain in the neck and you get fever and then you get better. And that's true for most kids. It's usually children. Um, but again, small number of people can get very sick. Seizures, deafness pneumonia, encephalitis, and death. It's rare, but it occurs. Three years and up? I don't know what the... Not infants. Mm. Yes? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions of, of Dr. Levin? No, she's joined us. Um, we, we appreciate you thank being you. here to answer the questions. <laughs> any thank comments? you for being here. Yes, thank you very much. Is there any uh, other discussion yeah. in the council? Councilor so, um, <laughs> it's interesting how we react to, for instance, requirements or mandates from the government. Of course, you can imagine, you would expect resistance to these things, and um, we don't all think with the same. We don't have the same philosophy about. We have a, a divergent philosophies, but I think when we talk, this is when we talk about. The value of the larger group over the people who, for instance, have a variety of resistance or concerns, either uh, real or imagined. And so the whole issue, it's been a long debated discussion about how, uh, what the authority is of the government to impose medical decisions. You know, we had a conversation about this earlier, but med medical uh uh, behaviors in order to uh, advance the best interests of the of the larger population, and and this was a, and these came at a time when um, epidemics were destroying large portions of the population. Uh, everything from polio to smallpox to uh, 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 typh uh, uh, typh typhoid fever. That was one, but the uh, 
Uh, what polio. is it? Thank you, polio, typhus, <laughs> tuberculosis. The And the thing is, is that, and that's when the government started actually imposing these rules about how um, communities should react. Hmm. And there was obviously a lot of pushback, and this even goes to the debate of like fluoridating water and things like that. Now, fluoridation on one hand is if someone resists drinking fluoride, fluoridated water, fine. It doesn't actually have an adverse impact on me. But principally, we the, also what we've seen recently is the increase of autoimmune diseases like HIV. The large segments of our population who are or very vulnerable, who, and, and for quite a period, there was an epidemic there that met political resistance that actually resulted in the deaths of thousands of people because of political indifference. And those people, those people were remarkably vulnerable. And I think what we're asking here is, is some continuity in the in the law and i think as Councilor bidwell pointed out some people have made rather facile use of the religious exemption and it is worth noting that the trend up for religious exemptions and i actually don't know i have not heard of an organized religion that actually opposes vaccinations i'm sure they exist or are being created now as we I speak know. i don't know can't answer it but i i and i I think that, and I've always, and I've, I've struggled with this, this, this debate in my head for years, back when I was in my 20s. I think I've now come, to, I've certainly come to a point where I am morally comfortable with the fact that we are, the best interest of the greater whole is better served by a, a vaccination that is efficacious at the same time the absence of it is a threat. and a threat to the people who are least able to resist those threats, who don't get a choice. And uh, so as such, I really have no problem uh, in supporting this and the intent of this and hopefully the outcome of this. Great, thank you. Any other comments? Councilor Nash. Thank you. Um, I, I want to thank the, uh, the sponsors for bringing this forward. Um, that, um, you know, within this, you know, while it's particularly about uh, measles, the measles vaccine, is it, there's a broader theme of, you know, the effectiveness of all immunization and that, um, that there's been a growing um, skepticism about the effectiveness of it. And I think it, um, you know, a lot of it stems from the, um, the, the, the success the, of, the, of the times that we live in. And, um, you know, so, you know, I remember as a kid that, um, you know, I think it was about once a year, I'm the oldest of six, my parents would take us down to the doctor's office. And um, <coughs> that my parents, because we were a big family, they arranged for us to go there all at once. And it was usually in the evening and it was dark out. And we'd go to Dr. Mannion and we'd all get whatever it was that they were sticking us with that, you know, that particular day. And that, um, <coughs> that uh, you know, my, my parents had no question this was the right thing to do. Um, that, um, th and that, you know, and, and I, there was this, I, I remember going to uh, a, a school to take a, a, some sort of drink for the polio vaccine, you know, that, Immunization was so much a part of you know this this new thing because it was saving lives, and um, and we all kind of got it, and um, but the in the next generation, you know, we look around today, you know, you know, kids are really healthy by and large, you know, and you know that um, you know the the um, the disabilities that kids are getting from um, infectious disease are way down. Um, and that was commonplace uh, a few generations back. And that, um, and I, I, the, the thing that stands out for me is I remember uh, talking with uh, grandparents and um, great aunts and uncles and you do hear the stories of 
the, the cousins and the siblings and the friends that they lost growing up because of infectious disease. And um, so, you know, I, I stand tonight 100% behind this because, um, you know, sometimes we just forget. And, um, and that I'm, you know, I'm, I'm really grateful for, um, you know, that I have that memory from, you know, from my family. And, um, and I'm hoping that that lesson can be projected today, that, um, uh, that um, you know, that science is okay. Science is a good thing, and that we've had success and we need to keep having that. Um, we don't want to go back to where things were. So thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Anyone else like to speak to the, this resolution? Looks like we're ready to proceed to a vote. Yeah? Okay, so I'd ask for a roll call vote. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Fine. Yes. Councilor LaBarge. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor Nash. Yes. 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 Okay. The resolution is approved. First reading unanimously. Um, the consent agenda contains the following items, which I will read at the request of any one counselor. We, I will remove an item for a separate vote. Otherwise, there is no debate on the consent agenda. First, the minutes of June 5th, 2019 special city council meeting, which was the budget hearing, and June 6th uh, regular meeting. Um, which is also the I continuation. Mean, so, yeah. And I would ask that the June 6th be removed. Oh, Just the June okay. 5th. So, okay, so it's only the June 5th, 2019 special council meeting, the first part of the budget hearing. Okay. Uh, next, the question of approval of a poll petition, 19043, National Grid, Verizon, New England. Poll petition for Fritz Pitt Road, petition 2785-9494. Uh, various appointments to committees. Um, which I'll ask the chair. These are for referral. These are for referral. So vote on these would be equivalent to referring them to the Committee on City Services for consideration and recommendation. Uh, 19,100 appointments of various committees. The Disability Commission, Rodney Cunath of 8 Reed Street, Northampton, from July 2019 to June uh, 2022. Uh, to the Energy and Sustainability Commission, Gordon Meadows of 239 Bridge Street, Northampton, for the same term, July 2019 to 2022. To the Planning Board, Marissa Elkins of 50 Washington Avenue, Northampton, again for July 2019 to June 2022. Next on the consent agenda, 19101, petition for annual secondhand dealer license. This is a new secondhand dealer license, which would be for Born Again Vintage and Consignment for Old South Street. The applicant is Laura Burke. So uh, move approval of the consent agenda. Second. Okay. okay, and seconded by Council of Barge uh, with the one removal of the minutes uh, for June 6th. But June 5th is still on there. Okay, so all those in favor of approving the consent agenda, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, any abstentions? So they are approved. Agenda's approved. Okay, um, so now we go to finance. Yes, we do. So we'll recess for finance. Great, so I'll call us to order and ask Laura to read our roll, please. Here. Councilor Carney. Present. Councilor Labarge. Present. Here. All right, and we have three items tonight. The first is 19097, an order to surplus the Prospect Street Water Department building. Order that whereas the city of Northampton owns property at 237 Prospect Street, known as the Water Department building, shown on assessor's map 24D, lot 2, and whereas the Department of Public Works has consolidated its water division operation. <coughs> in one location at the city's Northampton Water Treatment Facility and consolidated its, its administration and engineering division at its headquarters on Locust Street and no longer has a use for the property. And whereas the city of Northampton does not have a municipal use for the property in Mass General Law, um, ch Chapter 30B, Subsection 16, requires a vote of the city council to surplus any interest in public property prior to its disposal. Um, and there's therefore order that the property at 237 Prospect Street is declared surplus to the city of Northampton's needs and is hereby transferred to the care, custody, and control of the mayor for the purpose of selling such property in accordance with Massachusetts procurement law and on such terms and conditions as the mayor deems reasonable and appropriate, provided that the property shall not be <coughs> and its current fair market value and if sold to a nonprofit entity shall be subject to um, the successful bidder entering into an agreement 
for the payment in lieu of taxes. Do we have a motion, Finance? Make a motion. Second. Second. <coughs> Second. Um, questions? The mayor's here. Uh, um, Director Lascalia made reference um, at the during the budget hearings that they've been um, slowly clearing things out of this building. Um, we're waiting for the final um, er erection of the um, storage facility at um, at the water treatment plant that was part of the capital program to move the final pieces out. Um, that um, building is actually slated to arrive on the 28th, um, and so we feel comfortable now um, bringing forth this surplus order to get it going through the process. This would be the fourth um, city building that we've surplus during my time as mayor, and it's a building we no longer have a use for. Um, Director Scalia has been able to consolidate operations and um, including getting all of the engineering staff in one place at Locust Street, which before they were dispersed, some were down on Prospect, some were at Locust Street. So she's been able to consolidate them on one place. And so we don't have a use for the building and we want to surplus it. So using the same process we've used before, we will um, ask you first to surplus it and then we will issue an RFP and uh, and see what uh, what the demand is in the community for the building. Hey, Councilor Dwight. Um, there has been, it, it actually, as we discussed at the last meeting when uh, Director Lascalia was describing this, as you say, there there is outdoor storage in the yard, or has been historically. Do you know of any 21E issues, or will there be a 21E assessment for the property? Um, typically, uh, well, there was a building that was actually set fire to and we um right, and right. yeah and so that had to be um, taken down mm -hmm. and um and you know and those would be the kinds of things that would be the due diligence of a buyer uh, to take care of um and, and, and should there be determined that there is a yes exactly then it, all falls on the it would yes it but i mean it, we've never had for example you know a gasoline uh, storage there any kind of fuel storage there um so I'm, I'm not sure what would be there. There was road salt there for a while. Time. Potentially, yeah. yeah. So, um, so that would be part of the evaluation or due diligence of, a, of any buyer that would be um, looking at the site and doing, you know, any any analysis of the site. So, um, you know, we would we would provide all relevant information about, you know, what, how the building was used, et cetera. But I'm not, um, yeah, I'm not, th I'm not feeling like it's going to be a rise to the level of a 21e site like you know like like uh you know locust street for example right. yeah right. so that's so fine um i hear about this building a lot from people they're always kind of wanting to know why it's empty why it's not being used how is it being used all of that kind of stuff and um i don't really have good answers for them and i i know especially with the rec department wasn't the rec department there many years ago yeah and now we built a, a prefab um next to jfk for them what can you just give us a little bit of history about that building and why it was no longer appropriate for the rec department why we had to build a new building um just generally kind of history so the rec department had been on the second floor of that building for a time um the building is not handicapped accessible. It's not ADA accessible. There's not a elevator in the building, um, and the building is very tired. It's uh, it's you know it was built in 1917. Um, it's not well insulated. It's dated. It's got lots of issues um, uh, in terms of uh, you know it, the, I think we've done an update to the boiler, um, but it's not. Uh, by any stretch, a modern building. So the 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 um, we we actually couldn't have the um, rec department in there now because it's not an ADA. You know, you, if you have a public office that someone's coming to, it has to be ADA accessible. So they had actually moved out and moved to Smith Voke actually for twenty something years, um, and then got evicted. So it's not we couldn't really move them back into the second floor of the uh, of that building. Um, and as I said, uh, now that you know, operations had been split between that building um, and and uh, the water treatment plant, um, and Director Lascalia has consolidated um, both uh, treatment and distribution in one location, um, and with the final addition of this storage 
building this cold storage building, um, we'll be able to move all the remaining equipment that's still stored at Prospect Street, which is everything from meters and hydrants and pipe and equipment and some you know, backhoes and some other equipment that's currently stored there and move it out. And then as I said in earlier in my <coughs> remarks, um, we didn't have space for all of the um, city engineers to be in the uh, Locust Street uh, facility. Um, working with the engineering staff <coughs> done a, and, and actually our central services staff, they've been able to do a, a whole kind of re-envisioning um, of the um, McNulty building at, at Locust Street and actually create now more workspace. Um, some of you remember the <coughs> Board of Public Works hearing room, which was a big hearing room where the Board of Public Works used to meet. Well, we don't have a Board of Public Works anymore. Um, so that's actually been repurposed now. <coughs> And that former windowless uh, room actually now has a couple windows and and um, and a proper heating system, and so we now have um, our our engineers um, in there as well as elsewhere in the building. So we've um, freed up enough space to move all the staff out, and now there's um, just the remaining equipment. But it's a building that has actually been slated um, for many many years uh, to be um, surplus, um, including you know my predecessor had been looking at it when there was talk about building a new a whole new DPW facility the thought was to surplus it and um, and uh, use the resources toward a new building under mass general law we can we must use the proceeds of a sale um, for capital um, and so we would be um, coming back to you as part of the capital plan to re out to alloc basically allocate the sale proceeds to a water uh, related capital project in the future so follow-up question, how much do you foresee the, build, the building being sold for? Well, what we would do is an, uh, we would issue an RFP. Um, we've had an appraisal done. We've had a, a third party <coughs> appraise the building professionally. And, um, and the fair market value that was given to us was uh, $290,000. Um, and so we will be using that as the, that'll be the minimum good. <coughs> Just the process we've used for all of these buildings we get an appraisal done and then we use that as sort of the opening bid just to ensure that the city at least secures you know fair market value so if that amount of money is raised by the sale of this building um, and needs to go into capital expensive uh, revenue does that not free up other funding in the capital budget that could be potentially used in other ways it's actually um, we're talking about the water enterprise so that building is owned by the water enterprise fund and it's been funded by the water enterprise um, and so the money would be reallocated into the water enterprise fund most likely in talking with director um, Lascalia uh, to water line replacement which is a which is a capital uh, item in the budget um, the ratepayers that basically have been supporting that building and paying for the work on that building and, and owning the building, so it really needs to stay within the water enterprise fund. So it really would just be um, going back to the ratepayers, technically. Um, and given the amount of water line replacements we're doing, including the Damon Road project we'll talk about later, um, they will uh, have a use for those funds to be put back into our water infrastructure. Yeah, so it doesn't really go to the general fund and it doesn't really offset a general fund expense because of that. Um, and obviously the, you know, the underpinning of the requirement is that when you sell something, it's a one-time windfall. So, you know, you would tech, you, you know, the law requires you to put it into capital. Um, and so uh, that's what we're, uh, that's what we do. We, you may remember when we sold Fiker School, we actually used the proceeds to pay for roof replacements at, um, at two of our current schools. So similar philosophy, um, whenever we've had a, a building sell with a, you know, a school building, we've tended to put it toward a capital project. You may remember you surplus these, uh, or put out for surplus the South Street School. Um, and I can say that the bids have closed on that and there's one uh, successful bidder, the Northampton Community Music Center. Um, so they'll be, um, we'll be now working to purchase, uh, uh, you know, do a closing on that building and I would foresee us using that money to go toward a school capital project um, like we've done before. And we have lots of needs in the schools. Yeah. Councilor LaBarge. No, she's already answered. You're all set. Any other questions for the mayor? On the Hearing none, then all in favor of a positive recommendation of finance, please say aye. 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 All right, the next is 19.
1908 um, an order for some more FY19 budgetary transfers. And so we'll be taking money from source sources and sending them to other sources. So um, the building department contractual services were transferring in $19,825. The building department personal sal personnel salaries, that's where the $19,825 is coming from. Uh, legal services were transferring in $85,000. From the assessor's permanent salaries were transferring in $1,618. Uh, from it, With the city clerk, uh, salaries permanent were transferring in $1,100 and $36 um, from our, our un unemployment personal services. We're taking out $35,000 to fund those transfers. Uh, medical insurance for employees, we're transferring out $52,754. Uh, highway department gas and diesel is getting $24,586. Highway department road improvements is getting $25,483. Highway department um, vehicle supplies is getting $40,288. Highway Department permanent salaries, $90,357 is coming out of that account. Uh, the sewer enterprise wastewater treatment plant long-term debt is getting $1,065. Um, sewer Enterprise Water Treatment Plant Electricity Account is transferring out $1,065. Stormwater Enterprise Flood Control Overtime is getting $8,000. Stormwater Enterprise Storm Drains Overtime is where the $8,000 is coming from. So in total, we're transferring $207,001 by this order. Do we have a motion in finance? So moved. Second. 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 All right. And Susan's here to answer any questions. Councilor Bach. Yes, Susan. Um, on the stormwater enterprise flood control, and the same also for the stormwater enterprise storm drains, how do you actually account for the overtime? Like you're taking it from one area and transferring it to another? Is that what right. you're doing there, here? There's two divisions in the stormwater and flood control enterprise fund. There's the stormwater, right. which is the drains, and then there's the flood control, which is basically the pump station. So is this $8,000 that right now is owed, but you need to transfer it or? So what we, we've, we've overexpended overtime in flood control because we've had to man the pump station. Okay. But we have not spent all of the overtime in the storm drain account. So all we're right. just moving money from the storm drain overtime to the flood control overtime. Right. Just because it's been so rainy, they've been running the pump station. A okay. Lot. So. Any other, uh, Councilor Bidwell? Uh, yes, the, the number that sort of jumped out for me was $85,000 being transferred into the legal. Is there some explanation there? That this has been, the, the last couple of years we've actually spent less, um, but it's somewhat a cyclical account because this is the year we've spent a lot in collective bargaining. Um, we've had all of the units open this year, which we did not have the prior two years. So that's really the reason that's for the... Thing. For the, for the increase this year. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any uh, Councilor Klein? I was just wondering if you need, you're going to request two readings because you want to reconcile this before the end of the year? Yes, yes. This will help the auditor keep up and everybody be able to look at more up-to-date financials if you do both tonight, <coughs> both readings. So two readings in the council meeting? Yes. Comes. Any other questions on this one? Hearing none, then all in favor of a positive recommendation finance, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. And the last is 19099. This is an order to dedicate Medicaid Part D reimbursement to the OPEP Trust Fund. Order that the city's, um, <laughs> that the city dedicate to the other post employment benefits liability trust fund, OPEP, um, and it's established under general law. Chapter 32B, Section 20, on June 19th, 2014. Any and all monies received and to be received in the future by the city as a sponsor of Medicaid Part D, Qualified Retirees Prescription Drug Plan. Do we have a motion of finance? Make a motion. Second. Second? <coughs> okay. Any questions for Susan on this? Is just coming in and going into the proper account? Could I just have a general explanation? I'll admit I just don't understand. Sure. Um, Medicare Part D. Uh, the city provides Medicare Part D coverage to our retirees through the Medicare supplemental plans. 
The federal government offers a subsidy under this program, and it's intended to provide a, an incentive to employers um, to continue providing prescription drug benefits to Medicare eligible employees. So we actually get a reimbursement from the government because we offer a good plan for our retirees. So this uh, reimbursement that comes in comes to us from the GIC it goes in it basically comes off of our monthly GIC bill but it in the December bill we got the reimbursement and best practice has been that communities have been taking that Medicare Part D reimbursement and moving it to their OPEB trust fund so that the money that comes in for retirees is actually going to help sustain the um, the provision of retiree health insurance in the future. Makes sense. Is it really substantial, or is it? Um, the it characterized? It, it, the um, reimbursement in, that we got in 2019 was actually for 2018, and it was about 220,000. Uh -huh. But it's going to continue to go down. The benefit will eventually disappear. Oh, okay. So. Thank you. Thank you. But it will get allocated to the right place until then. Correct. And we won't have to do this order again. Right. Yeah. Right. Council Labarge. And you're requesting for two readings, Susan? Uh, I believe I yes. did, mm -hmm. yes, yes. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Any other questions on this, on this order? Hearing none, then all in favor of a positive recommendation in finance, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? And I think that wraps up our... Did you <coughs> finance meeting? Right. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah we, we did do the minutes. minutes. Um, I got so excited by the orders. Then a motion to approve the minutes of June 6, 2019. Second. Any other discussion on the minutes? All in favor? Aye. And with that, a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we're going to take up some financial orders now. Um, Heard about them in finance, the first three of them. Anyway, 19.097 order to surplus Prospect Street Water Department building. Motion to approve this, approve. please. Approval. Second. And seconded. Any further discussion on this order? Um, seems to make sense to me. So, hearing no discussion, I'll ask for a roll call though. Councilor Klein? Yes. Councilor Gabar? Yes. Councilor Murphy? Yes. Councilor Nash? Yes. Councilor O'Donnell? Yes. Councilor Shara? Yes. Councilor Yes. Councilor Carney? Yes. Councilor Yes. Yes. Okay, that's approved on first reading. Next is 19.098 in order for fiscal year 2019 budget transfers. Motion on this, Move please. Okay, made and second. Any, any discussion on these transfers? I second. Okay. And I'm um, second. So, any discussion? No discussion. So let's have a roll call. Councilor LaBarge? Yes. Councilor Murphy? Yes. Councilor Nash? Yes. yes. Councilor McDonald? Yes. Councilor Shara? Yes. Councilor Goodwill? Yes. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. Suspend the rule. Okay, approved on first reading. I hear a motion to suspend rules. Second. Second. Second reading. Second by Councilor Klein. Any discussion on suspension of rules? All those in favor of suspending rules, please say aye. 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 Opposed, any abstentions? Is there a motion on second reading? Second reading. Second. Seconded by Councilor LaBarge. Any discussion on second reading? Hearing none, I will ask for a roll call vote. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor Dan. Yes. Councillor O'Donnell. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Goodwill. Yes. Councillor Carney. Yes. Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Klein. Yes. And Councillor Labarge. Yes. Okay, that's proven. Second reading, budget transfers transferred. Next, 19.099 in order to dedicate Medicare Part D reimbursement to OPEB Trust Fund. Okay. Made by Councillor Labarge, second by Councillor Dwight. Any discussion on this financial order? Um, as for a roll call. Councillor Nash. Yes. 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 First reading. Councilor Klein moves. Uh, Councilor Labarge moves to suspend the rules. So we'll have for second reading. Is Councilor Dwight was a second. Yes. Uh, the Councilor Bidwell was. But oh, we'll Councilor Bidwell. Was, <laughs> she was propus. For the record, it was Councilor Bidwell. And um, any discussion on the suspension <clears throat> of rules? All those in favor of spending rules, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Motion? A second. Motion for second reading. Second. Okay. Made by Councillor Dwight, second by Councillor Klein. Any discussion on second reading? Hearing none, I would take a roll call. Councillor O'Donnell? Yes. Councillor Shara? Yes. Councillor Goodwell? Yes. Councillor Carney? Yes. Councillor Dwight? Yes. Councillor Shara? Yes. Councillor Goodwell? Yes. Councillor Carney? Yes. Councillor Goodwell? Yes.
White. Yes. 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 Okay. Approved on second reading. We have a number of financial orders on second reading. So we're going to run through them expeditiously and we can be on top of our game about making and seconding motions so we can go through them um, with due deliberation when we need to. But these are all have been discussed at the last meeting. Okay. So 19.081, an order to borrow money and authorize acquisition of 100 acres at Pine Grove Golf Course. To approve. Second. Second. Okay. Any discussion on this order? <laughs> Uh, on second reading. <clears throat> Hearing none. Oh, Council Bibble. I would just like to thank the mayor or Director Fiden, whoever provided the tax analysis that put some numbers to what we were conjecturing when we uh, talked at last meeting about the net fiscal gain potentially from this. Good. Great. Any other discussion? Okay. So let's have a roll call on second reading. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Yes. Councillor Carney. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor Murphy. Yes. Councillor Yes. Yes. Councillor Yes. Yes. Approved in second reading. Next is 19.082 in order to purchase 5.8 acres in the Broadbrook Fitzgerald Lake Greenway. Move approval. Second. Okay, made in second. Any discussion on, on second reading? Hearing no discussion, let's have a vote. Councillor Bidwell. Yes. Councillor Carney. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor Murphy. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Donald. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Okay, that is approved in second reading. Next is 19.084 in order to appropriate fiscal year 2020 general fund budgets. The second reading. Move approval. Okay. Made by Councillor Dwight. Second. Second by Councillor Nash. Um, further discussion. Um, I, I understand budget hearings went well and you had very lengthy meeting that night um, and the following night in the City Council and lots of discussion about the budget. So Councilor LaBarge. Yes, I was just wondering if I could have Susan Wright come forth because I'd like to just question her on something. If Director Wright is willing to uh, come forth for a question, <laughs> we always are happy to have She's her. always good. Okay. Yes, Susan, on our budget book, and I mentioned it two weeks ago, about the senior center with the twenty thousand dollars in the um, gift department. So I think I think you're asking me about the revolving fund yes. order, right? Um, and because I had questioned the mayor, he didn't know he had you come forth, and you said, and I told you that department. So, Councillor, um, I think this is going to appear later on the agenda when we get to the revolving fund order. So no, no, this is in here, in our budget. This is uh, order. for the general fund budget. Oh, okay. So let me go to. Are you talking about um, the, the senior center budget? Yeah. The revolving fund. The revolving fund for the gifts. For yes. The gift store. Yeah, yeah, that's coming up in the revolving fund order. Oh, okay. So yeah. that'll be coming up a little bit later, and she gets, we can certainly address that then. And also, I have another question for, for the mayor, too, after. <coughs> I'd like to know if you can give me, because many people have been calling me, um, how much money do we have in the um, school committee, which I need to know, because I can't get the answer, because we're still in litigations, but in the rainy day fund and the school department side. Do you know how much being the chair of how much that rainy day fund is just the school? Yeah, that would be the um, school choice budget that um, is controlled by the by the um, school committee. Those are school choice funds um, that come. Uh, if we look in their budget, which is contained in here, um, I can't cite it off the top of my head, but it certainly would be contained in their budget. Um, I don't know if you have access to it, Ms. Wright. Um, uh, I, I do find it. They have it. their school choice budget on 161. Yes, 161 is their school choice. Um, uh, and it gives you what that rainy day fund is? It's, 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 it's not really a rainy day fund, but it's school choice monies that they receive um, based on students that choice into the district. Um, and then they are used in the following year um, to help support the budget. 
um, the the superintendent superintendent provost has actually created sort of a sustainability plan using the school choice funds similar to our um, sustainability fund and so that's what they they have been um, so he has a similar uh, stability plan so you can see um, in that on that particular page um, uh, how much they're using from school choice to fund um, certain aspects of the um, of the school budget they definitely they obviously try to use the appropriation budget then they do use some uh, school choice funds so they're using a 2.2 million dollars it looks like um, to help support their budget so it's a 2.5 million or 2 million uh, I was saying they're two using 2.2 two million, two million. Um, two million two hundred forty nine right. two point two million yeah as part of um, supporting their um, their budget and you can see the positions that they're spending them on um, I'm just questioning it because I'm getting calls no. about the rainy day fund yeah school department. I've never heard it referred to as the rainy day fund. that's what it's they're the calling school. it I'm just saying that well you have the former school business manager for NPS so do you want to describe how school choice typically gets right. utilized and it, if you look on counselor if you look on page 160 of, of the budget book they have um, listed all of their various um, accounts and you can see their school choice account the balance at the start of the year was 3.6 their revenue is 1.4 their expense is 1.1 so their ending balance they say is 3.9 and that is for 2018 so they came into 2019 they were using some of their school choice money they've budgeted on page 161 to use they show you what they budgeted in 2019 and they show you what they're budgeting in 2020. So school choice money comes in when students um, tuition into the district. Um, it's roughly 5,000 per student and then if the student has special ed, is in special ed, there's also a factor that comes in for that. And how Northampton Public Schools always uses school choice is that they, they the money that comes in in the current year is what is budgeted to be used in the next year. Some school districts run things so tight, they're usually <coughs> using the money that's coming in that year in the current fiscal year. Northampton has always taken the money that has come in in a particular year and waited to use it in the next year so that they always go into the next year with the money in hand um, as they develop their budget. So, um, and as the mayor said, um, it is the school choice account. I know that it's sometimes referred to perhaps as the rainy day account. It's not really a rainy day account. You, it, it is the school choice revolving account. Because that's all I've been hearing about is a rainy day account. And right. when Provost was here, I asked him about that rainy day account. And he said, no, he had not gone into it at this point. No, he is, he is, the, the school budget like, has used the school choice yes. every single year, at least a million or more right. okay. for the past 15 years. Um, and so they, this is where, if they end the year with any um, surplus in their appropriation budget, they move money around so that they are able to keep it. If you notice, the city always has the school department 100% fully expend their appropriation. We never ask the school department to give us money back. So if they happen to end the year with any additional surplus, that money would flow into this account as well, and then they would use it for their students for the next year for the budget. Thank you very much. Okay, good. So any other discussion on this? This is the order to approve the FY 2020 general fund budget. No discussion on that matter. Uh, okay, hearing none, uh, we can proceed to a roll call vote. Councillor Carney? Yes. Councillor Dwight? Yes. Councillor Klein? Yes. Councillor Labarge? Yes. Councillor Murphy? Yes. Councillor Nash? Yes. Councillor O'Donnell? Yes. Councillor Shara? Yes. Councillor Yes. <clears throat> Okay, it's proven second reading. Next is uh, 1908 500 approved fiscal year 2020 sewer enterprise fund. <coughs> Remove approval, please. Okay. Second by? Second. Second by Councilor Sherry. Any discussion on uh, this financial order? Second reading. Uh, roll call then. Councilor um, Dwight? Yes. Councilor Fine? Yes. Councilor Labar? Yes. 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 Okay, proven second reading. Now, uh, 
six in order to approve fiscal 2020 water enterprise fund budget moved to approve second okay, made and seconded any further discussion on this second meeting then we'll have a roll call councillor klein yes councillor labar yes councillor murphy yes councillor nash yes councillor o'donnell yes councillor sharon yes councillor Bidwell. yes Yes. <coughs> yes. That's approved in second reading. Next is 19.087 in order to approve fiscal year 2020 solid waste enterprise fund. To approve. Second. Made and seconded. Any discussion on this order? Hearing no discussion, I'll ask for a roll call vote. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. 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 Okay, it's approved in second reading. Next is 19.088 in order to approve fiscal year 2020 stormwater and flood control enterprise fund budget. To approve. Second. Okay, made by Council Bar, second by Council Dwight. Any further discussion on uh, this financial order? Hearing none, roll call. Councilor Murphy? Yes. Councilor Nash? Yes. Councilor O'Donnell? Yes. Councilor Sharon? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. 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 It's approved in second reading. Um, next on second reading is 19.089 in order to approve fiscal year 2020 revolving funds. Motion to approve to get this on the floor. So moved. Approval. Okay. Made and seconded. Uh, the mayor's office has asked to amend. 19.089 in second reading to increase the amounts of two revolving accounts because of increased activity. Uh, senior services activities increases from 90,000 to 150,000 and senior services food, uh, food services increase from 35,000 to 90,000. Um, Director Wright, would you like to speak to this? So, so what you're doing in this order is you are setting the spending limitation for all of these um, revolving funds. And these revolving funds used to be reauthorized by City Council every year before the Municipal Modernization Act passed. After the Municipal Modernization Act passed, it required that the revolving funds be created by ordinance so that they would remain basically until you change the ordinances. And then all you're doing at um, once annually is saying this is how much we're allowing to be spent from each of those funds. Um, the reason that I asked to have um, two of them amended is after our last meeting, I realized um, with our new senior center director and her enhanced focus on um, the food services program and the things that she's doing in the activities revolving fund that I needed to um, increase the spending limits given what I had seen going through that account this year. So, so basically you are just saying to each of these individual departments that have these revolving funds that they are allowed to spend up to the limit that you vote. Now the question that Council LaBarge had about the gift uh, senior services gift shop revolving fund. The gift shop um, has closed at the senior center. Um, it still has a revolving fund because it was created by ordinance. The before municipal modernization, if you didn't reauthorize it, the account just went away. Now that it's actually been created in or in the ordinances, the gift shop revolving fund exists until we change the ordinance. So I'm having you vote a spending limit because it still exists. But it is possible um, that the senior center uh, administration will decide that they are not going to revive the scene, the gift shop or anything, and we will ask through the route that you have to change ordinances to delete that revolving fund. But since it still exists by ordinance, I, I need you to vote a spending limit for it. Um, so questions so far? Let's get first, <coughs> let's get a motion on the floor to amend the order. Uh, um, and so I'll just suggest, I mean, we have in front of us, I think, was submitted an amended order. Right. Mm -hmm. okay. so well, I'd, like to, uh, I'd like to move approval for the amendment. Okay. So the amendment is to um, substitute the old order for Second. the new one. Equivalent to what you just said, Councillor. So, and that's seconded by Councillor Klein to reflect those increases for those two funds. So that amendment is on the floor. Any questions for the <coughs> about the need? <coughs> Move to approve as amended. Well, no. First, we got to vote on the amendment. But I thought oh, I saw Councillor. Uh, Susan, right, thank uh, you. Is this really an oversight or an adjustment that was made upon request? 
Um, after at the last meeting, as you were reading through these, I realized that the senior center one, I had not changed it from the prior year. I had basically used the same levels as the prior year, and that was the those are the only two <coughs> some significant change in activity. So. And, and also, uh, can we expect an order relatively soon to uh, rescind the gift shop account? That I need to speak with the senior center director to see what direction she <coughs> wants to go in. So, but right. the, the gift shop closed some time ago. So, yeah. okay. Any other discussion to the amendment for those increases? Do you have something? You seem like you might. I just wanted to clarify for the public, just to explain that the revolving fund is takes money in right. and then expends it. So it's not <coughs> allocating more money from the budget to the revolving. We're just saying that this is the limit. It's a limit of a revolving fund. So it's money that they take in, you know, for trips or activities, and then they expend. Uh, you know, so that's. I just want to clarify that that's okay. what the difference is if for you, people who may not understand what the what a revolving. Right. And fund if you look is. at sure. the Thank ordinance, the ordinance describes for each one of these mm -hmm. funds what the revenue source is, how the what kinds of monies come into it, and what are the limitations on what can be spent, and which department head has the authority to spend. So. So it's not affecting the bottom line. Of the no. No. The city is just setting limits. That's the limit that's re required or appropriate. It's fine. It's fine with me. Uh, discussion, uh, more discussion on the amendment. Okay, we can do the amendment with the voice vote. All those in favor of uh, amending, please say aye. 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 Those in abstention. Move to approve as amended. Okay, I think I think we have it on the floor already. <coughs> um, and unless I'm mistaken. No, it's just. <laughs> Uh, so, no other discussion as amended. So we can have a roll call. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor Donald. Yes. Councilor Shera. Yes. Councilor Yes. 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 Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. Councilor Labar. Yes. 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 Okay, that's approved on second reading. Next is 19.090 in order to rescind, barring authority for three votes. Uh, that are listed in the order. Um, this is on second reading, so you had it last time. Motion approval. Second. Okay, made by Councillor Bidwell, seconded by Councillor Dwight. Uh, further discussion on this order? Okay, pretty straightforward. Um, let's have a roll call. Councillor O'Donnell. Yes. Councillor Sherrill. Yes. Councillor Bidwell. Yes. Councillor Carney. Yes. Councillor yes. Dwight. Yes. Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Murphy. Yes. And Councillor Nash. Yes. Okay, approved in second reading, next is 19.092, in order to rescind unused borrowing authority Move to for MSBA projects, Bridge Second. Street, and Leeds School. <coughs> Second. Okay. Uh, so made by Councillor Klein, second by Councillor Dwight. Any discussion on this similar order to rescind borrowing authority? Okay. Discussion heard, so we can have a roll. Councillor Yes. Councillor Yes. Councillor Yes. 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 Councilor yes. 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 It's proven second reading. Um, this next one is execution of an order of taking for Damon Road reconstruction. An affirmative vote were authorized city councilors to sign the order of taking. What's going on here is uh, on May 16th of this year, the city council approved 19.061 in order to appropriate money and authorize taking by eminent domain for Damon Road reconstruction. Um, that authorization was passed, but no document was executed um, to specify how the property would be taken in what way and for the purpose of recording at the registry. So Attorney Seawald has submitted an order of taking for execution by the City Council uh, and recording at the registry. And the City Council, you know, just for good measure, is going to actually vote um, to execute the order and then sign it. Um, so, yeah, and we have it here, uh, Mr. Mayor. You seem like you like to speak. No, no, no just as, and you have a copy of yeah. in great detail, mm -hmm. um, and you got a map before of all the various parcels. And this uh, document spells out what exactly the taking is. In some cases, it's just a temporary easement for five years. In other cases, it's a sliver of land, and sort of spells out. And each one of these property owners has been met with by our consultant and they've all received a certified letter indicating that this is the amount of compensation you can see all those various amounts and we've appropriated the money um, so now this is the final piece of um, getting this executed so we can um, 
satisfy to the state that we have the proper easements in place for the construct reconstruction that the state will pay for. So I'd first like to get, thank you, I'd like to get this on the floor first, the motion to approve so moved. Second. Oh, made and seconded. So Councilor Barge, you had a question? Yeah. Mayor, so all mm -hmm. these lands that are going to be taken either at, by a temporary easement or whatever they're going to do on the mm -hmm. takings, the businesses have agreed to this? Yeah, we've re well, we've reached out to all of them and provided them with all of the information and met with them and, you know, given them the, um, the estimate based on the appraisals that were done. Um, and, you know, it's obviously, yeah, that's where we are. Uh, they know that this project's going to happen. It's obviously going to be a major undertaking, but I think they understand the importance of the improvements. Um, they're told how much money they're going to be getting. That's correct, and, and you can and see. They have, I understand yeah. that, so they've agreed to that, um, the acceptance of how much money they're getting. Well, they've agreed to it in that they've had these, you know, they've had these individualized meetings and they've been presented with the information, but ultimately what we're doing is you know, we're doing it as a taking because okay. um, that's the easiest way for us to have, you know, clear title and um, and do the project. So, um, you know, so like this very last page, there's a business, you know, Mox Chip and Ale. Uh, I think that's what it's called, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, they're they're going to be paid um, $17,300 for a temporary easement. Um, and that's, you know, it kind of goes through what's going to happen. And mm -hmm. um, and so you can kind of go par parcel by parcel. Um, and so once this is executed and filed um, on, with the Registry of Deeds, then all of those checks for those various uh, easement amounts will be issued to all the property owners. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Hey, uh, Councilor Nash. So is there anyone who unwillingly is participating in, you know, like, this is, is what I'm you know, it, I don't, I, I can't really answer that. I don't know that anyone, okay. I mean, you can challenge the damages. You could, there's always the right to challenge the damages. Mm -hmm. If you feel that the damages are not um, sufficient for, you know, the, the easement or whatever it is. And so that's certainly, everyone still retains that right, but we have to kind of go through this process. It's just sort of the process. But again, as I said, there was a group meeting with property owners and then there's, you know, we basically had basically paid a firm to go out and meet, you know, with each owner individually to discuss the impact on their property. And, um, and then, you know, once we got the authorization um, and the funding, then we were able to you know, actually provide them with this is what your actual offer will be. Yeah. So, uh, so the test will be obviously if somebody contests the damages. But um, but again, I feel like we've been we've done this process fairly openly and mm -hmm. you know, had you know good communication with everyone and and obviously I think you know businesses particularly understand how uh, challenging Damon Road is right now um, for pedestrians, for safety, for traffic, um, and especially at the intersection. So this is going to be a major improvement in the roadway. So hopefully I'll, they'll see it as um, improving the value of their property. Um, at the end of the project, so. Further discussion on the, the vote to ex, um, execute the order of taking. I'm obviously not gonna read the entire document. I trust counselors have reviewed the document. I would like to just read the front page. I mean, we're taking property, so I'd like to um, just get that in the record if I might. Uh, so what will be passed around for signature, uh, the first page is, is going to be the order, order of taking the undersigned being duly elected sitting members of the City Council of the City of Northampton and the Commonwealth of Massachusetts acting under the authority of and in accordance with the provisions of general, of, general, of general laws of the Commonwealth as from time to time amended. And more particularly chapter 79 and chapter 82 and pursuant to the order of the Northampton City Council, a true copy of which is attached here to is Exhibit A, this year by take for and on behalf of the inhabitants of the city of Northampton, the parcels and interests referenced in exhibits B1 through and including B25 attached here to for all purposes for which public ways are used in the city of Northampton, including the widening and reconstruction of Damon Road and Bridge Road, both being public ways in and for the city of Northampton. The parcels hereby uh, taken are shown as on a plan entitled Alteration of Damon Road and Bridge Road prepared for the city of Northampton. Um, dated, you have some uh, dates to be filled in, but roughly June 2019, and recorded in plan book. <coughs> so 
citation for the location, the plan book, and the page, apparently, and are more particularly bounded and described as set forth on exhibits B1 through and including B25 attached here, too. The owners of the parcels taken here under and the damages awarded, if any, are set forth in exhibits B1 through and including B25 attached here, too. In accordance with Master Law Chapter 79, Section 6 is amended. Such damage awards are made by the City of Northampton for damages sustained by the owners, owner or owners, and all other persons, including all mortgages, mortgagees of record, having any interest in the property and entitled to any damages by reason of the taking. The City of Northampton reserves the right to amend the award at any time prior to payment for good cause shown. No betterment shall be assessed as a result of the improvements uh, to Damon and or Bridge Road. Okay. So I've just read that into the record for good measure. Um, we have a motion on this, correct? Yes. We do. So if there's no other comments or discussion, I'd like to have a roll call vote on this, please. Okay. Um, Councilor Bidwell. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. 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 For extra good measure, we want to spend rules to allow for a second reading. Uh, Councilor Dwight, did you have something else? No, no, that's that's fine. Uh, the rules say everything has to have a second reading, and this is kind of, you know, an unusual instrument we're considering. So, uh, do I hear move to suspend rules? rules. Second. Okay. Discussion and suspension of rules for that purpose. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 The extension. Mm -hmm. Motion on second reading, please. Uh, second. So Councilor Bidwell, second by Councilor Sher. Any discussion on second reading? Councilor Dwight, did you have something to raise? Or? No, no, okay. it's coming later in the agenda. Got it. So, all right, so any other discussion on second reading about this execution of the order of taking? Okay, so I'll ask for a roll call on this. Councilor Carney? Yes. Councilor Dwight? Yes. Councilor Klein? Yes. Councilor LaBarge? Yes. Councilor Murphy? Yes. Councilor Nash? Yes. Councilor O'Donnell? Yes. Councilor Sharon? Yes. And Councilor Yes. Okay. Approval and second reading. So now, I, I'd like to move items A, B, C, D, and E as a group. Second. Okay. I think others have had that idea as well. Mm -hmm. um, so, we're moving as a group. 19.054, an ordinance allowing marijuana testing and processing in core business districts. 19.055, an order in. Excuse me. All right. Everything's fine. 19.055, an ordinance allowing marijuana production, cultivation, testing, and processing in the PV district. Also 19.056, an ordinance amending the requirements for medical marijuana operations by adding air filtration. 19.057, an ordinance amending the requirements for marijuana manufacturing in the OI and GI districts by adding air filtration. And last but not least, 19.054, an ordinance clarifying the provisions for outdoor growing of marijuana. So, point of order, it's actually 058. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, but the others were correct. Yep, it's spot nice. on. The last one, 19.058. All right, and we have this motion as a group? Yes. Made and seconded, okay. Second it. Um, so, any discussion on any of these ordinances, which were all approved at the last meeting, are all in second group? Tonight. Okay. Hearing none, let's have a roll call on these five, please. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. Councilor Lamar. Yes. Mm. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor Shara. Yes. Councilor Bidwell. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. Okay, those five are approved on second reading. Um, <laughs> if I may, I'd like to we have suggest seven that of them. we move. Yeah, well, with that. Seven of them. Uh, the ordinance is under 17 items uh, 19.068, uh, 69, 70, 71, 72, 73, and 74 <coughs> as a group, which would be it's listed under subsection A, B, C, D, E, F, G. I'll second that. Motion is made and, and seconded. Um, the, the process note here is the package of seven ordinances to add definitions of short-term rental, STR, and owner-occupied dwellings, change tourist home bed and breakfast, <coughs> bed and breakfast, and allow STRs in all zoning districts, including uh, PV. So that process note is there because the, was there a change from last meeting to this meeting? Okay. 
So that's a general description of yes. what they do, which is not new from this meeting. Okay. Uh, so for the, the benefit of the public, we read out the numbers, but I'm going to read the titles to the consternation of, of many. 19.068, um, an ordinance to amend zoning to add definitions of short-term rental and owner-occupied dwelling. 19.069, an ordinance to amend zoning to allow short-term rentals in WSP, SC, SR, and RR districts. 19.070, an ordinance to amend zoning to allow short-term rentals in URA and URB, URB districts. 19.071, an ordinance to amend zoning to allow short-term rentals in the URC district. 19.072, an ordinance to amend zoning to allow short-term rentals in GB and NB districts. And 19.073, an ordinance to amend zoning to allow short-term rentals in the CB, EB, HB, and OI districts. And finally, 19.074 is an ordinance to amend zoning to allow bed and breakfast and short-term rentals in the PV district. So those are all the ordinances. Any discussion on any of them as a group? Have it as a motion, right? Yes. Okay, so hearing no discussion, it is. let's have a uh, roll call. Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor Labar. Yes. Councillor Yes. Councillor Yes. Councillor Yes. Councillor Yes. Councillor Yes. 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 All those passed in second reading. Any new business this evening? It's a motion. I'd like to move the term. I'd like to second. Okay, so made and seconded. Vote. All those in favor. Thank you. Thank you. Started. All those in favor of adjournment, aye. please say aye. 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 Same session. Thank you. Good night.